act is wildly wrong in this. Oh, yeah. I, I thought, just... Yeah, I thought that the judge was Frank Thring, but of course he's not. He's Noel Ferrier, who... It's really weird. I've seen him in a couple of things. He was in Year of Living Dangerously. He's almost like a straight Frank Thring. I mean, straight, not necessarily as in straight or gay, but straight as in not wildly over-the-top uh-huh, uh-huh. campy like Frank Thring was. And I swore that one of the guys was a young Jeffrey Rush. How about we introduce the podcast and we talk about that? That sounds good. Uh-huh. All right. No will worries we do the others? All. I will. So... Welcome to Podsploitation, the Ozploitation podcast. I'm Callum. I'm Daria. And I'm November. And we are hitting the summer of Alvin. Oh, God. Over this and... And the God next... have mercy on our souls. <laughs> Over this and January and February's episodes, we'll be tackling the three films of the Alvin Purple Three trilogy? Colours Purple. Three Colours Purple. Oh, God. Yeah. Well... It's a duology and one pimple on the butt it kind of tacked on last. Oh, by that's all a girls. bad analogy with a movie with this much nudity. Oh, no, I think it's completely understandable <laughs> that you'd have a pimply buttock in this because there are a lot of pimply buttocks in this movie and probably in the other two too. Well, not like pimply up close, just pimply as in that generic thing of pimply buttocks. <laughs> Unattractive what? male buttocks. Oh, okay, right. I didn't realise those two things were interchangeable. No, I thought pimply yeah, I thought pimp- had literal pimples on it. Yeah, well, no, I thought that's what it meant. Yeah, no, yeah no, but it's more of a kind of a general... Did you, uh, anyway, yes, never mind. It's... Okay. <laughs> Off to a flying star. Okay, oh, as anyone who has ever listened to this knows, we shit at explaining the film, so I'm just going to read out these few short sentences from Wikipedia. Sounds good. Instead of us trying to dissect this... For half an hour and still not getting past the second scene. Alvin Purple is a sex farce which follows the misadventures of a naive young Melbourne man, Alvin Purple, whom women find irresistible. Whom? Whom? Working in door-to-door sales, Alvin unsuccessfully tries to resist legions of women who want him. Alvin is so worn out, he seeks psychiatric help to solve his problems. His psychiatrist is, of course, a woman. Alvin ultimately falls in love with the one girl who does not throw herself at him. She becomes a nun, and Alvin ends up a gardener in the convent's gardens. Jesus, they're really good at that, aren't they? They're way better at that. Oh, yeah, well, no, yeah, they're uh, way better at that, that than we are. No, it does yes, kind of make are. it sound like it's the <coughs> psychiatrist who becomes the nun. It does, yes. Oh, yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah. And the other thing as well, and I saw this a couple of times, is describing Alvin as a waterbed salesman. And this is one of the things that really strikes me about this kind of movie is you can't really describe him as anything. It's a little bit like saying, you know, Stork, a university student or something, because it's like it's a little aspect of one point of what he does. He bounces from thing to thing to thing. He's unemployed at the start. It's near the start is his 21st birthday, and he's had more jobs than he's had birthdays by yeah. that stage. And we happen to just see him when he's very briefly given the waterbed salesman so he can play the I've come to clean the pool in the bed sort of gay. I've come to clean the bed pool. The bed pool. And then it moves into something else. So it's really weird to describe him just when, especially when in this sort of thing you can say a larrikin or I'm all an stuck Aussie on all or... the things that describe this as a sex comedy. I'm like, did anyone laugh at all during this film? I'm sure they must have done in the 70s, mm. wouldn't they? Oh, why did they add canned laughter? We go to the movie, oh, everything's God, normal, yes. and then suddenly canned laughter appears. Yes, and I swear it sounded like the default canned laughter from MASH. And if you yeah. ever listen, you yeah. can tell it's the same piece of recorded canned laughter because there's a squeak in one of the tracks. It's really hard to explain, but there's like a weird little high-pitched gasp in one of the main parts of the canned laughter they used on MASH. You hear it over and over and over oh, and over and over. I'll have to watch next time MASH is on television, yeah. which is probably 27 times a day. Yeah. A week, but many. But many? many. Oh, yes, it is, one of the, it is one of those ones that just keeps getting played over and over. But yeah, if you listen for that little squeak. But yeah, the canned laughter was odd. Anyway. Okay, so let's... The trailer? That's a... Yeah, I know it's got root bits in it. <laughs> <laughs> Oh god, that music. <laughs> yeah, I'm rather accustomed to that music after Kanga trailer. Yeah. yeah, yes. Did we ever work out what that shape is meant to be in the. At first I thought it was a keyhole, but they don't have teeth. Too. No, and it goes outwards slightly. All of them in full working order. He is what yeah, but he's not. Alvin Purple. Handsome. <laughs> Charming. Artistic. <laughs> From the very start, it was obvious. Here was you see? Man with what? I don't know. I was going to say, it seems kind of fun-ish, like everyone's... Well, they all seem to be having fun. Yeah. Even, the... even if the paint did remind me of Santa Spread. Yes. Yes. Yeah. 
Nothing wrong with that. <laughs> Always on good terms with the staff. Oh, Mrs. Hood, there are openings everywhere for the right man. Find out what you want to do, and then extend yourself. <laughs> he became a dedicated ah, uh, the water bed. In this world, there's no one who can afford to be slack. In fact, oh my God. he spent most of his time on the job. <laughs> No. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't remember John's character. Mm. Yeah, that. The sex pad, or whatever. Mm. Is there a giant penis in the foreground of that shot? Oh, that's what I didn't have a waterbed for the first one, so they could do the. The under... bouncy. Yeah. Springs. From underneath. Yeah. They completely use the skydiving scene. Yeah. Oh my god. I'm wondering whether or not it. Yeah. Creepy doctor. Oh dear. That must smell then. <laughs> Girls in the 70s didn't sweat. Even in Australia. <laughs> Fantastic outfit. Yeah. Ah, <laughs> oh, no, Feria. I swear that was trying to be a bit like that giant penis in Clockwork Orange. Mm. And Reaping Menace is hilarious. Yes. Bedroom Mazurka, that was the one that was in the on the poster. It was. I haven't heard of What's Up Doc, though. Yeah, no, I can only assume that's not any references to Warner Brothers cartoons. Bloody hope not. Seems yeah. safe. Probably. Yeah. First scene of this movie, does her t-shirt say women should be obscene and not heard? Yes. It does. It does. So why not just have obscene and heard? <laughs> like, it's still silencing women. You're allowed to do the sex act, but don't speak. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I, just, I can see what they're riffing on, but after the riff's done, it doesn't make sense anymore. No. I'm far too white and penis to make any comment on that one, so I'll let that slide. <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to be apologist on that one. It starts so. when Alvin is 16, he's being followed by... Well, that's a flashback. We're already going Nolan on this shit. <laughs> <laughs> I read one uh, review that thought Alvin was supposed to be 16 through the whole movie. So why did he look 35 when he was 16? I guess it just sort of was weird Dawson casting stuff. Yeah. And don't forget, this is also the kind of the start of the real proper porn films out of the States where you've got actors who are in their mid to late 20s playing school Teenagers. cheerleaders and stuff. So that's not going to be well, yeah, not too much of a... 90210 mm. that had one of the characters in his 40s being a coach. Oh, yeah, there's that, that Simpsons joke where you close in on the guy smiling and it's just all wrinkles all around his eyes. Mm. Or as TV tropes calls it, Dawson casting. Dawson oh, casting, Oh, they do, that's yes. the actual trope. Yeah, yeah. right. Um, I would have thought there'd be things before Dawson that would claim yeah, sure. the name. Ah. I think this was just easiest to wrap yeah, up. Fair enough. <laughs> Most socially aware way back when we were there about Dawson's Creek. I have problems with the movie poster. The one with you have problems with the movie poster? Okay, I know. This is a bit of an easy leap. I don't, know if we've, the... I don't know if we've done this before. Yeah, before even getting to the movie. So... There's a couple of different posters for Alvin, but one of them has got a bed and two sets of feet. And my problem isn't just because they're feet. I, I remember you mentioning this, and it is actually a little interesting. So it's directly from sex scene that's in the, the film. The first sex scene, I think. Sex scene. It's the one that plays under the opening credits. Yeah. Why are you putting sex scene in hand quotes? I don't know why. Especially for I, water. Yeah, it doesn't work. <laughs> well, well, and it's a sex scene. <laughs> well, yeah, okay, yeah. It's because we see feet and that's it. And, yes, the rest of it's nudity. So, yeah, okay, but you're right. It's, we sorry, see to me, to me, it's, to me, it's like literally the step up from basically a train going into a tunnel. But, yes, you're right. It's a sex scene. Anyway, yeah. Okay, so we have the feet on the bed. But the poster, the woman's feet are much, much smaller. Yeah, significantly smaller. Yeah, I just found that troubling. To the point where they obviously... Dario's looking at us a bit confused. Yeah, it's really strange. I'll see if I can find an image, because in the sequence in the film, they're pretty close, and I'm guessing it's because they're probably yeah, Graham Blundell. It's, and... it's on the Wikipedia page. Yeah. 
Oh, yeah. That look. looks like child's feet. It's really yeah. gross. Yeah, yeah. Like child's feet or enormous grown up feet. Well, yeah. yeah, I had a discussion with this with Mr. Friend, who said maybe they made his feet bigger to indicate that, you know, he's, he's a... well endowed. But the point of Alvin is not that he's well endowed, he's just meant to be any old bloke. Uh, not necessarily. The point about Alvin is he has something. Something. But that nobody knows him... what it is. True. And. I thought it was just meant to be exceptionally ordinary. This is something that in this film alone, but also into the second and third, if we can peep ahead slightly, mm. in it goes between him having some almost magnetic magic quality, mm. or he's just that person who many of us know who, despite not being conventionally attractive, seems to always have people falling all over themselves. But alone. he's not charming, he's not... Particularly talkative. He's, he's he, he doesn't speak much. No, he's he's bumbling. And in fact, the main thing that he does is he goes along with it. In one of the sequences in this film, especially where you could argue it almost dips into an interesting level of satirical commentary on what would it be like if this was a guy, not a girl, who's stunningly attractive. Which yeah. I think, if I'm going to give Alan Hopgood in particular, who wrote this, a bit of a pass. I believe that's sort of where he was going after he got the initial concept. And then, of course, a lot of the movie was changed. And there's, a there's lot we'll, talk was about, we'll talk about that. But if you're thinking about that thing, it's not that he, and he actually says at one point he doesn't even enjoy it. If you were to suggest that there was anything under the surface of what's just basically a bit of a fun sex romp in the ilk of Carry On and very definitely Benny Hill, he doesn't get anything out of it. He actually confesses to Tina, the, the chaste love interest. He just goes with it the way he, he feels he interacts with people. But you must enjoy it. Well, I don't know that I do. It just seems to happen all the time, so, so I'll let it. Saves time in the long run. Saves time? What for? I don't know. Alvin, why didn't you stand firm? What? Why didn't you resist women? Mm, I don't know if I have to resist them or they have to resist me. I don't always know who starts it. Well, you could always stop. Mm, it's not that easy. And don't you enjoy it at all? No. Well, I suppose if the girl enjoys it, I, I sort of feel it hasn't been a complete waste of time. And it's really cool because it's, it is one of those okay. things that is a trope and a cliche that can be done very positively and done very negatively of the idea of this is how people make friends. It's normally as the through female sex. through sex. So, yeah, he just... Okay. Hmm. Have you fucked Ruddy? I haven't fucked Ruddy. No, 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 no. I'm not. Hang on, wait a second. And I'm not suggesting we should hit people with baseball bats either, but we thoroughly enjoy flashbacks. I'm saying the only <gasps> way to make friends. What? I'm, not, I'm not saying the only way to make friends is to fuck people. Or hit them with baseball bats, apparently, because oh, no, 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 no. the back half of that sentence. No, okay, right, sorry. The reason, the reason I being... I don't understand what okay. you're saying. So the point being that, you know, we've seen horror movies where people get hit with baseball bats. I'm, so uh -huh. I'm pointing out that this is a movie trope. That this is a very specific kind of focus. No, the only female he's friends with is the girl he hasn't slept with. Yeah, not just in this, in general. Oh, right. The cheerleader who makes all the friends in the American film by basically being the school slut or whatever. No, I don't know. I think I just watch too much horror because if you fuck someone, you then die. <laughs> well, this is true. I mean, yes, that's a separate Screw trope. Screw well. But there is a particular character and a particular story plot that follows on the lines of the character that is seen as the promiscuous character in the film or the story or whatever. It is just their way of making friends, or they think they're making friends, and it plays out in the film as either they realise that it was never necessary at all, and the person that they have the deepest connection with is the person they never have sex with. I think I've just been watching way too much young adult fiction lately, because usually the person who sleeps around gets slut shamed. And that's another thing I was going to say. There's a ton of that too you don't that make they set with them up. As... <laughs> but. Sex as a way of connecting with a person is a character, and it's a bit like using rape as a driving force for a female hero to find themselves. It's such a lazy hack piece of nonsense, and it's used again and again and again really poorly. But what I'm trying to say is that it's the way Graham Blundell's character in this seems to be interacting, is that he just accepts that part of forming any connection with another human being at some point involves sex. I didn't get that at all from this. 
Really? Yeah. I thought that's the subplot of the film. Daria? No, I, I didn't either. In fact, he seems to have a remarkably little connection from most of the people he has sex with other than having sex with them. But that's yeah. the point, and that's the tragedy of Alvin. That's what I got from the bridge confession. He doesn't even enjoy it. He doesn't do anything for him. He gets something him. out of it. Like, he guess it's okay if the girl likes yeah, it. Yeah, and that's the only thing he gets. I just couldn't stop thinking about reversing gender roles in this movie. And that's what I thought they were maybe trying to do the other way around, because to me especially when you're looking at the porn films of that era and just in general, the woman who, you know, pays for the pool clean with sex. I mean, it's, it is. It is a, it, it was a cliche of something ridiculous, but the idea being that it's what if it's the guy that has to do it rather than the girl. So, so we have this 16-year-old running away from these girls who, actually, there's two schoolgirls fighting near the start of the film, and it looks like one of them has got a small tattoo on her leg, which I'd find... Oh, really? 1973? Yeah, yeah. Mm. But this wasn't Blu-ray, this was DVD, so I didn't actually check. Mm, yeah. Uh, but it's yes. not such an actual school girl. No, I well, should no, none of them were, yeah. Um, but no, just a tattoo on girls in 1973 is quite unusual, mm. really. Yeah. Which I think is how you get away with some, some stuff by having these near 30-year-olds playing the teenagers. Yeah. But imagine, like, if the story had a girl running away from a pack of marauding boys, mm. went to the school mom's house, she wasn't there, and then school mom's hubby fucks her. Oh, yeah. Like, this is... <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. And that's then when you have to ask the question, if you give them the credit of what they were trying to achieve, and let's face it, a wacky comedy is a really blunt instrument to try and then deliver a, an important message on gender promiscuity and what is it? Concept. And I mean, I don't know how much slut shaming would have been a thing back then. I think it's in, in a been concept a in and of itself, yeah, it. maybe, and that's the thing. It's hard to know. We're still definitely in the era where a met not wanting sexual attention and getting it anyway is simply hilarious. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. As, yeah. yeah. And it's on the same par as if men are sexually assaulted, that's comedy. Yeah. And in this case, though, doing the adult as children thing does at least give them a bit of unreality around mm. it. So even though it's what it's depicting is horrible, it gives a bit of a disconnect I for the audience. I never actually mm. looked up how old Graham Lundell was when he made this film. So he, he would have been, been 27, 28? Yeah. God, really? Yeah. Yeah, it looks older, but then that was just the time. Really well, this sad. is the other thing, too. And, well, like, can I also just take a point and say, with the exception of Graham Blundell, every, every single... single man... Hang on, I'm going to say it with you because I think I know what you're going to say. Every, every single, single middle-aged man. man in the early 1970s looks, looks like, like a, a used car, car salesman. salesman. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, the, the party that he's at, because of the clothing and the hairstyles, they all look like mm. greasy used car salesmen. I mean, I we don't that. usually go to the lol people in the past look different. Okay? Oh. Because it's so easy, but this is... One of the 70th looking films we've ever covered. It really is. No, 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 usually you have more sideburns. Yeah, but I think but of everything else, though. It's, well, even yeah. number 96, when we, because I mean, you, you often, I remember when we were watching it with, with you, and you were like, oh my God, that dress is fantastic. Oh, I do love the 70s. There's very little kind of. T- there were Actually, very little Alvin had a pretty funky outfit. I had a really cool jacket. He did? Yes. The end. But yeah, I'm 100% with Daria on this one. If you were to make people look as 70s as possible which as we've discussed previously when we reference back to the future it's very difficult when you're within the time period to yeah. ham up the time period ring because you don't know what's going to yeah. carry yeah this looks as 70s as 70s can be oh my god what if the people who made back to the future actually had a working time machine <gasps> that's how they did it dun, dun, dun. no they would have stopped biff tannen from becoming american president that's true <laughs> hey daria we did mention the 21st birthday is that they're singing a version of he's got jolly good fellow that i'd never heard before had you come across it no, I'd heard the 21 Today song before. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and then they had a couple of lines to it. Oh, he's a jolly good fellow. He's friendly one today. Hey! I've always impressed on young Elvin the value of a variety of experiences. And as he's had 11 jobs in the past two years, you can't say that he's exactly ignored his father's advice. But I think he's beginning to learn that in today's world, you must specialise in something or you won't get very far. It's your life, Elvin, and this is my last piece of advice to you. There are openings everywhere for the right man. Find out what you want to do and then extend yourself. In this world, there's no one who can afford to be slack. Extend yourself, Alvin! 
Ah, uh, yes. In your endo. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, of course, they don't sing Happy Birthday because the IP wrangle was in Of course. Yeah. It's been settled. Apparently, at one point, they found out that the people who supposedly owned the copyright didn't own it or didn't own it in the way they thought they did. Yeah. Mm. Hey. <laughs> I still say there should be a subclause that allows the judge to reach down and wipe somebody upside the head with a rolled up newspaper and say, stupid. Well, I'm just picturing the lawyer in Liar Liar. <laughs> Stop breaking the law, <laughs> asshole! <laughs> so, yeah. How cool is it to have somebody who knows all about copyright and everything? I know, it's awesome, hey. It's fantastic. I mean, one of my favourite little unusual films out of the States, uh, The Wizard of Speed and Time, they don't actually sing Happy Birthday. They sing a weird version called Merry Birthday to You. Oh, right. Yeah. yeah and there's loads of he's a, she's or he's a jolly good fellow stuff. Yes. But you know what I haven't heard? Well, maybe I have and I've just forgotten. But the Aussie birthday song? There's an Aussie birthday song? Yeah. Like, he's named Callum and he's true blue. He's a piss spot through That's and through. That's not a birthday song, is it? That's just yeah. a drinking song. Oh, I didn't know it's a birthday song either. No, I thought oh, it was, okay. just, a, it was oh, just a... Maybe it's just all peppers. Yeah, maybe. No, I've only ever known that as a song that people would sing when they wanted somebody to knock back a drink. Oh, I've often heard Happy Birthday lead into that. Ah, oh, no, no, that wouldn't surprise me, actually. Yeah, mm. you, that expectation of knocking back a vast amount of alcohol, because that's what makes us Aussies. Yes, it is. With that said, not that much actual drinking in this. No, there wasn't, was there? And the other thing I was going to say, this was R-rated when it came out, wasn't it? Because yeah. it was like full frontal Liddy. I don't recall a single swear word. In fact, I think at one point somebody makes a joke I think we about have currently already in this podcast sworn more than the movie did the whole oh, yeah. 90 odd minutes. And apparently I'm a potty mouth, so I apologise for that. <laughs> but yeah, because at one point, I think when he's talking to the psychiatrist, she says something that rhymes with fuck. Flux. That's the right. Flux, yes. And Alvin says, sorry, what did you say? And she has to re-emphasize. I said flux. So I'm pretty sure, yeah. I'm pretty sure there's not a single swear word. I don't even think there's a shit. I think that's really interesting because so often we have R-rated movies or movies that have got mm. severe restrictions. Mm. Like we censor sex and not violence mm. and language. Whereas this one's totally okay with sex and doesn't have swearing and doesn't mm. really have violence. That you see is an extreme when you start looking at video games. So video oh, games yeah. can have an R rating, but consensual sex is still two oh, of the three things that get censored. People still associate video games with children. Yeah, but this is the thing. I mentioned before, Yati Kroshaw, the uh, Zero Punctuation, he actually talks about a scandal called Hot Coffee. Which oh, is yeah, the, this is yeah, the GTA I know, oh, or... GTA San Andreas this is like oh. the th- the seventh one which was actually number three or four yep. and yeah and there was like consensual sex in it one of the mini games was get sex with people and it was completely consensual because you would basically woo someone they also use condoms I possibly I don't know about that uh-huh. but that they might have been my yeah, yeah as he jokes you know people who'd let consensual sex in the middle of their policeman murdering simulator yeah yeah and that's actually really interesting in this instance if you look at the other way it's like you've got full frontal nudity male and female male and female and a couple of sequences I noticed which when they were filming, the simulated sex couldn't have had the modesty pouch that guys usually wear because you went straight from disrobing full frontal nudity to actually the simulation of the act in a single shot without a cut. So mm. apparently, yeah, when you're filming a sex scene in a non-pornographic movie where there's actually penetrative sex, you wear a weird Yeah, it's little... like a sock that's stuck to you. Yeah, yeah basically. And it allows for what looks to be naked buttocks without actual any sort of risk. Mm. But uh, yeah, I think one in particular, one of the, towards the end when they're showing the various shots of the sex that he engages in as, as a sex therapist... Yeah, it, it goes from one to the other. So there was all but. Yeah. And yet, yeah, no swear words. <laughs> it was certainly all but. There were a lot of buts in no this movie. Yeah. And in, in the contemporary making of thing, Graham Blundell's talking about how he trained himself not to have erections. Oh, God. Oh, God. Cool guy. The, the, the... How did he do that? Margaret Thatcher naked on a cold day. <laughs> Where does that come from? I don't know. <laughs> Apparently the opposite. He like he said he wandered around his house naked thinking of, Dirty things to sort of like... Oh, um, de... Desensitise. Yeah. yeah. Um, kind of a bit like immersion therapy, I guess. Yeah, right. Mm. I will also dial back just what I said before about how I don't think there's any drinking. There's, there is drinking because obviously there's champagne during the sex scenes and there's parties and stuff, but there's none of that stalk-level Aussie blokes... Just knocking back. Knocking back. back. Yeah, beer after beer, after beer after beer after beer after beer. Because it's not that kind of thing. And no vomiting, which I'm sure you were very happy about. Always. Mm. Always <laughs> happy to not have vomiting. <laughs> yep, agreed. Yes. Oh, dear, the second Barry McKenzie's going to be fun when it turns up. Yay! Anyway. So the music. Weirdly changeable. 
I think Brian Cadd made this film. Oh, yeah. And here's the best thing about this movie. And there's but a fun what little is wall. with that off brand yakety yeah, sax mixed with a car horn that's license free? Yeah. They use a couple of times. As November said, it was damn close to plugs music and it kept coming yeah. up. Yeah. And in fact, I think it actually pops up when he's been chased by hordes of women, doesn't it? It is. Yes. It does. It's yes. so Benny Hill. And this was actually. Because I was going to talk about that as well. So we were talking about the idea of that gender swap. You know, it's the guy that's got all of the magnetic power. But the fact is, it's already been done by Benny Hill. Benny Hill's already had, you know, the unwanting advance being chased by hordes of women. And they did it in Monty Python and the Meaning of Life as well. I don't remember Benny Hill that well. I thought he was often chasing women. No, he was being chased? He was being chased. But But were they attractive women like they were in this? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. He a bit like Paul Hogan's TV show as well. All the women were very, very attractive, and the encounters were all about, you know, misinterpreting boobs and everything. And he often... I read a review of this. It was of someone complaining that they couldn't find Australian actresses with nice faces. I didn't know what he was talking about. I... Mm. Yeah, that's really harsh, because I'm going to say that I would say the faces... that They're all very attractive in that... <sighs> Ooh, I don't think I should have said this, because this is going to go downhill fast. I can see someone who is used to the American symmetrical ah, Hollywood All right, beauty, Callum, I get you and well said. Being a bit surprised by the kind of people in this film. But I found all of the, the women attractive in their way and I think it's just that you expect that, you know... I'm sort of simulating kind of grid patterns of the eyes must be X amount of size and sort of shape across whatever. And and speaking of attractive, Abigail had billing in this film. We had Abigail. Was she in it? 30 seconds? I say that's a very nice see-through I'm getting. Oh, I didn't think anyone would notice. I've been wearing it for days and nobody said a thing. And that's a very nice pair of breasts you're wearing too. Oh, do you like them? I should say I do. Very well uh, moulded. Thank you. I find the very... Disturbing, very um, provoking. Provoking? What way? But it wasn't like that at all, was it? No. Gee, you got nice tits. She got to slap Graham Blundell after he told her she had nice tits. Yes. I think she might be the only actor besides Graham Blundell who's in all three movies, too. Oh, really? Oh, really? Okay. Sorry. Does she have a bigger role in the next two? Because I haven't seen them yet. The second's the ones I've seen the least of at this point. I know it's significantly bigger in the third. Uh-huh. No, so go speaking ahead. of that scene on the tram with Abigail, that, this goes back to what we talked about earlier, this is almost from a different movie. His approach to things, his issues, are kind of different to where they end up going. Mm. At this point, he's worrying about his own intrusive thoughts. And yes. he's fantasising, inverted commas, because... He may not be doing deliberately of ripping off the other passenger's shirts or mm. talking to the Abigail passenger about her breasts and exchanging ideas with her about them. And he's having a voiceover to us about how these thoughts are bad for him and if he ever acted on them, he'd be... In the can. Mm. Like, please yeah, care can. about sexual predators. Anyway. And in fact, it's interesting because it's... Sorry, how did you finish that thought before you dropped it? Yeah, but that's kind of a different thing because this does lead him to the psychiatrist, which is most of the story of the film. Mm. Yeah. But at that point, he doesn't have the women are irresistibly attracted to me thing. It's more the I can't get them out of my head thing. Yeah. yeah. It's almost as though the later line with Tina of the is it me resisting them or them resisting me is kind of designed to paper over that. Mm. Yeah. Because without the flashback, you could almost say this is a magical movie thing where the minute he decides he's going to go celibate... Is when for the sexless seventies for the sexless seventies, and then you know the joke being that Lynette Curran, the first of the two Sugar Girls, who we thought were, were the, both same, the person. same actress. How did that's... you go with that? Because we had the neighbor yeah, comes for have... a cup of sugar, and then neighbor comes for a cup of sugar, and we couldn't work out what was going on because they looked exactly the same to me. Mm. Oh, yeah, I thought they were the same person too. Yeah, sorry, yeah. Jackie and Lynette. Yeah. <laughs> but obviously back then they were just going with Random the blonde. attractive blonde. But yeah, and it could almost have had. Here's the wackiness of the minute he decides he doesn't want it, it now is being delivered to him mm. in droves. I, I mean, there's God, there's comedy TV shows where subplots of people who put on wedding rings immediately becoming attractive and yeah. things like that. So, so at the start, he didn't want to think about sex, but it was just constantly being shoved in your face. Mm. Well, I guess the flashback is meant to suggest to us he's so tired of it by now. Mm. And I guess we have, which may or may not be explored in the sequels, we haven't seen them yet, that 
between school and when we see him on the tram, he's just had a decade or two of all the sex that he gets nothing out of. But the intrusive thought thing pretty much disappears after the tram scene, as does the voiceover. Yeah. yeah. Mm. And, yeah, I thought we were going to have the voiceover right through the movie and it just gone. Mm. Yeah. It's not as jarring as Howling 3's random reference to the cameras in it. It's... You can... I will say, though, it is... They didn't it bookend is, it, though, did they? No. Yeah, sorry, yeah. It is quite a good way of... I mean, they're pretty exploited but quite a good way of portraying intrusive thoughts on film. Mm. To, to do the yeah. actual play out the scene and then play out the reality of yeah. the scene instead. And his yeah. reaction sort of being a bit sort of, I wish I hadn't thought that, but I did. Yeah. I was trying to remember. It, it, it struck a chord with me, and I'm, I'm sure it's been used more times than I can think of, but I can't think of any at the moment, where you see a sequence occur thinking it's reality, and then you cut back to the character that you're seeing it from the point of view from, yeah. and it hasn't happened. And I believe there's a sequence like that in Fight Club, but as a narrative tool, it's kind of awesome. You just play it out as if it was real, yeah. and then you, you sort of... It must have been used hundreds and hundreds of times, but I, I just couldn't think of any other really overt examples of it. Well, I think to people of our generation, it's from the, the Body episode of Buffy. Oh, yeah. Um... Oh, my God. Oh, don't. Just don't. Because <laughs> <laughs> oh. you tarry up. <laughs> but we've played out the Wikipedia super summary but basically you've got your three i mean it's almost like the classic call to you know the hero's call so you have the reluctant hero who and this is where alan hopgood apparently actually got the concept from so he was in the uk and he was talking to a psychiatrist which he was very clear to point out was not his psychiatrist who had just started to utilize uh, sex therapists what do they call them sex sex surrogates sex surrogates so people, I don't know that term. So the, the concept being that people who've got very specific forms of issues get recommended to somebody who expands them in a sexual direction, the, the clearest one being the way it's <laughs> done here. But, well, as a matter of fact, I happen to have a very good friend who's in the fetish scene in the ACT, and she has occasionally been referred people with uh, psychological issues to work through repressive stuff. So it's a thing. No, no, um, I was but yeah, laughing no, I at you. We use the word expand. Yes, no, I... Uh, I yes, we're, we're back to the 21st birthday. Yes. And, yeah, so this, Alan was apparently fascinated by that. And he then had the concept of, well, what if there's a guy who has this sexual magnetism, mm. goes to a therapist and says, help me deal with this, and the therapist then turns around and says, actually, what you've got is a superpower. Mm. Let's use it for good. And it's apparently the real sticking point between Alan Hopgood and Tim Burstall, who directed it, and the rest of the people involved with the movie, was in Alan's playthrough, I kind of get the impression that the therapist is a bit of a hero, whereas uh -huh. obviously by the time we get the movie we get, it turns out that the therapist is the villain and indeed not a therapist at all. Yes, but... It it's slightly confusing because we do have two therapists and one of them is the oh, sorry. ward yeah, sorry, and the, the, the other the is the woman. The, yes. And we definitely get the impression that the female therapist is working for the male therapist. So Dr. Liz Sort, who's played by Penny Hackworth-Jones, is yeah, working for Dr. Yeah, I didn't get Dr. that they had an equal relationship. No, he's to me at least he seems to be the boss. I thought so. Yeah, if not her boss in a senior position to her, depending yeah. on how widespread this psychiatric practice is. Well, it's got like a really good view out of the 1970s window, yeah. <laughs> and indeed, he kind of creeps on her at one point as well, because, yeah, sex romp. Yeah, yeah. And the way he ends up playing it with Alvin is less psychiatric sex surrogate as I send horny people to you and I line my pockets. Yeah. And then as we learn right towards the end of the film is he's also got a side hustle in pornographic movies as well. Yeah. Remote control cameras in 1973 <laughs> operated from the next room. What's the possibilities on that? And especially ones that are small enough to be able to do the full pan tilt and follow of the acts Indeed. without being seen. Yeah. I, yeah. I don't believe they had micro drone cameras. In yeah. Remote control cameras. <laughs> okay. That's actually not that different. But one that you could yeah. fit in a wall inconspicuously. In a wall and which can apparently get nice up and good angles and... Yeah. Especially if they're supposedly in a place where the people in the room can't see them. Yeah. Mm. That's the key thing. If they're hidden in the wall, there's only so much they can see no matter how remote controlled they are. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> yes. And there's not that many mirrors around because obviously the other thing is that you can't film with mirrors back then because you just get massive booms and in, in shots oh, yes, and all that kind of stuff. There's some pretty hefty blocking you need to do. You can't just clean it in post. Certainly not on the budget of this film, which we can mention now or come back to. Booms painted green screen yet? Like now? That's a really good 
Okay, I was about to say something really stupid, which is I've never seen a green boom, but of course well, you wouldn't. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Oh, no. I, um... Don't forget. Oh my god. There could have been a couple of million. In uh... camo. <laughs> Going. Scott Adams, the creator of Dilbert, reckons that the MAGA march, the, the million, million MAGA march, MAGA march that they like, reckon was about like, ten or 20,000 like people. there's just 10,000. Mm. But... That's because a lot of the people who support Trump wear camouflage and he doesn't think camouflage might turn up on film. So, so maybe there were like four or five to, million. I thought it was oh, two to, three, two to three, million. three million. Maybe three to five million. Yeah, yeah, it was quite special. So yeah, so what we have is Graham Blundell. He's struggling with the fact that he's massively attractive to women and he doesn't get anything out of it. And a mate of his, when he laments that he hasn't got a job, a mate of him says, you should start selling waterbed. So they've got a two-man team. He's the sales agent, and Alvin goes house to house doing demos. Now, I... Which seems very impractical. Yes, because I've owned a waterbed. Yes, you did. And I will say there are three things about waterbeds that make it impractical to sell door-to-door in full demonstration mode. One... It's not even about water usage in the 1970s. Oh, God, it's not about water usage. Number one, it takes a long time to fill. You start from scratch, you've got a good hour and a half fill time. Granted, they do bring this up. Yes. Yes. Number two, once they're full, they need to be warm or they're not comfortable. Yes. You have to warm them up. All waterbeds have got warming mechanisms and things, which then means you have to fill the water with chemicals because it's exactly the perfect bacteria set. Number three, when you need to empty them, that takes twice as long. Yes, because you simply have to open it up, and for the first period of time, they weigh a ton. You can't even move them, so you have to let them automatically pour out before you even get to the point where you can physically tip um, them up. A litre of water weighs a kilo. How many litres of water does a waterbed fit? I don't know, but many. Yeah, at first I thought he was installing rather than demoing. Yeah, yes, correct. Same. Yeah. And he ends up going from door to door and selling to mostly attractive women. Well, that makes. Well, okay, it doesn't make sense as in the man mm-hmm. held most of the financial responsibility mm. but women would be home during the day oh, and yeah. husband wouldn't be oh yeah and certainly in the early 70s yeah, yeah. and i initially but was is like... she allowed to make such a large financial decision well there used to be enough sitcom things about how the man would bring home the money and the wife would just take it from him that i'm guessing oh god so true i guess yeah. he is at least some kind of stereotype or truth behind that stereotype to enable wives to make household purchases, which mm. a bed would count as. Yeah. And the other thing is that... Because that's what we should have looked at in the yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But I do remember thinking initially, it's like, oh, this is an interesting take. This is basically that I've come to clean the pool, but from the point of view of the pool cleaner. Well, I realised then it's not from a different point of view. It's just from a different pickup in the story. Because at the, at the oh. end of the day, your porn film is notionally from both and almost always from the point of view of the pool cleaner anyway it's just that it starts when the pool cleaner comes to the door or whatever i mean i know it's a cliche it's actually not as common but yeah the concept of the guy you know the handyman or whatever and then the female throws it it's actually pretty cliche bog standard it's not as it's not as subversive as i kind of initially thought in my head because we're seeing it from the point of view. all we're doing is we're getting a bigger story so yeah mm. and we get some representation in that part i'm huh? sorry daria <laughs> mm. is, is that you? Who else would it be? Christ! 26 minutes in and we hit transphobia, homophobia, you actually just not- phobia. Yeah. Yay, predatory trans women. Oh, Ooh. my God. I just... Granted, there were plenty of predatory cis women here, so I... Can't <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, this maybe it's just women are predatory. Mm. If you have a penis or not, you're still a woman, but you're a predator. <laughs> and I'm going to say that for a... I don't know whether or not the, the actor in question was trans, because when I actually looked them up, it was the only film they actually had on their IMDb <laughs> page. I thought a perfectly feminine looking... But yeah, this concept she that got seal of you, <laughs> you wouldn't even bring it up until it's that time. Yes. It's just... It's nonsense. I'm sorry. Mm. This is not my soapbox to climb. (laughs) It unfortunately plays into a thing that's going around now, 40-something years later, that trans women are always trying to trick people into sleeping with them. (laughs) Where a straight woman just get them drunk. (laughs) (laughs) 
can't be Keith with Mr. Jones of all the top noses. <laughs> <laughs> and apparently that's enough to make him give up his waterbed selling career. Yes. To the consternation of whoever's writing the video box and summaries. Well, at least he didn't burn in clothing. I know, how many candles were in that room? That scared me. There was a I lot of candles. I'm going to say there was a lot of candles in there. I mean, he actually made a comment about that number of candles in that room. Oh, is it your birthday? I'm not that old. I do actually remember... You would have to be saying, a vampire for that to be your birthday. Yeah, we should turn out the lights. And I remember thinking, what fucking good's that going to do? But yes, no, I... Yeah, that was cringy. There will always be those moments. And... There will always be those okay. moments? No. No, I, I look in this context, in this kind of movie, in this kind of era. I don't know. Are there transphobic shit in the next two? Oh, I don't doubt it. Are there? I can't remember. I, the second ones are the ones I've seen the least, and I don't remember any from the third. But I haven't sat down and rewatched recently any except yeah. the first. Yeah. I know there is some delightfully homophobic stuff in number three. Mm. The second one's quite campy, isn't it? I read the second one's quite campy. Yeah, the second one actually has. Less of the sex fast thing. Yeah. Not okay. none, because it's still Alvin Purple. Yeah. Mm. But the main story is less concerned with his sexual escapades than this Oh, okay. Yeah. So two things. I read something about a poster and then Alvin Purple's head. I'm just like, oh, Purple Head. That's why he's called Alvin. Well, apparently... Alan just dropped purple in. He swears he just came up with the name. So his wife's hairdresser he look up was purple head on like Urban Dictionary. What? Yeah, <laughs> and some park the purple Pajero in the pink cul de sac. What the something. fuck, dude? But sure. <laughs> oh, that was, that was some <laughs> Tim Ferguson's line in the Doug Anthony All Stars. Was it? Yeah, parking the pink and purple Pajero family wagon in the velvet cul-de-sac. Oh, man. I'm just here. If I've got that somewhere, that's hilarious. <laughs> but Alan reckoned that I think his wife's hairdresser in the UK was named Mr. Alvin, and he decided purple was a funny name. Maybe Mr. Alvin had purple and hair. He was a hairdresser. Maybe. Because this is the other thing that's interesting, is that when it had its international release, for want of a better word, and apparently it did not do very well internationally. Oh, no, apparently it broke box art records in New Zealand, I think they were saying. But its release on the West End was not particularly huge. They called it okay in the West End, it didn't do good in America. Oh, okay. And critics hated it here. Because they called it the sex therapist. Yeah, well, critics might have hated it, but uh, yep. And as we saw when we were looking at the trailer about Barry McKenzie, where they're interviewing the people coming out of... God, whichever cinema it was, going, oh, yeah, he's a bit of a laugh and everything, and all the women are there grinning on the arms of the boyfriends, and it's like, oh, I'm really glad you dragged me to that. <laughs> okay, I'm distracted by something, and so I've got to bring it up. Yeah. You were talking about the waterbed and feeling it and the temperature and shit? Yes. So we've got a scene where there's a little bit of play going on and Alvin's naked, dressed up. So this is the famous image. So in the same way that... What's Dudley Moore's character that... Uh, the one in Arthur? Arthur, that's the one, yeah. <laughs> so in the same way, that kind of classic image of what Arthur looks like in his hat, Alvin Purple, one of the sort of the main weird oh, silhouette images hat. of, of Alvin Purple is spurs. him in oh the God. top hat. So we have Alvin Purple basically naked except for a top hat and, and spurs. spurs. And obviously, at some point, these spurs dig into the waterbed, but they continue to frolic. So, mm. my question is, is that water freezing cold or just full of bugs? Having owned a waterbed, <laughs> it would need to be one or the other. And I'm going to go with the former, because it's just been filled if we work on the principle that... Oh, no, I mean IRL. Oh. Yes, there's water in a bed... What water would these two people be in? Hit us up, Graham Blundell. We didn't actually hear anything about it. Was it cold water? Did they warm it for you? Or did they just treat it, like, bleach the fuck out of it? You've got to be careful. I know that when they use water in film, water is usually really cold in movies. And, you know, then there's shrinkage and it's sex scenes. I'm glad you brought that up. (laughs) Because <laughs> I did want to point something out. We've actually lauded certain films in the past for showing full frontal male nudity. Oh, um, everyone says, oh, he's so brave. No, 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 no. <laughs> I wasn't going to go down that road. What uh-huh. I wanted to point out was there is a natural aspect to the moments that we see Graham Blundell full frontal. Nothing, and I'm going to say this to a certain extent as well, I got, mm. why it's his male, again, from the women, the actual nudity in context almost always worked for me. Yeah. That I never saw anything particularly... Especially... I never saw a condom, but go on. Oh, God, yeah, it was the 1970s. I never saw anything that specifically looked like they were trying to hide his junk, but at the same time, we never got it in our face, as it were. Oh, dear. And vice versa, there was some pretty blatant nudity from the females, but not all of them, and not all of the time. It just yeah. honestly seems to be camera angles. It really did feel to me, at least like when they're filming this, director and camera people, okay, go for it, get naked, have fun, do this sequence, this is the sequence yeah. we want you to do, and then 
if you naturally happen to be in shot, you were in shot, and if you weren't in shot, you weren't in shot. And that's, I don't know, to me it didn't seem overly gratuitous for what it was. I don't know. I don't know. I did catch a small section of it behind the scenes with the scene we were just talking about with the Oh, the writing crop, yeah. And, yeah, it just looked quite weird because they seemed to be in quite a small space. So they're all really close. And they've got these two, this actor and actress naked and mm. everybody else is just... I know, doing their job as normal, I just thought that just a bit of an I guess the environment. The thing I'm trying to get at is, if you say look at something like Fast and Furious, they talk about the fact that the cars are their own characters, yeah. especially in the first couple, and that yeah. because of that you have hero shots of the vehicles, you yeah. have hero shots of bits. Because the cars are family. Oh, they are. And then you look at something like a, a full-on porn film, and to a certain extent, the actors themselves are secondary, the genitals, the boobs, the cock and everything, they're the... Yeah. Stars. When you're treading this weird little middle ground of like kind of sex romp or whatever, it's a fine line between we're here to see the actors do their thing or we're here to look at their bits. Yeah. Now, tits are tits, and especially in this era and this type of film, the tits are going to be front and centre from the point of view of making an appearance. Well, I say tits. Okay, right. I'm sorry, I'm trying to use the vernacular of the time. The breath. <laughs> it was, that wasn't the issue. All right. The point. Okay, what I'm. I think it was your existential approach to memory glands. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my point, my point is that there will be br- the, the appearance of breasts in a film like this will be about the breast appearance. Will be will be about let's focus and get the framing right, right okay, and let's sure. see the boobs. Uh-huh. What I'm getting about with the sex scenes in particular, and certainly the parts where there's nudity, it really struck me that they were going. This is about Graham Blundell being nude with. Penny Hack with Jones or with Jackie Weaver. Or, it didn't seem to me that any of the blocking and any of the camera setup would have been specifically about let's focus on genitals or the junk, let's focus on the interaction between the people, and the fact that they're naked is just part of the storyline. Don't you, you know think what that's I mean? just it's because, it's it's a because it's a sex comedy rather than an actual porno? Well, I don't, I don't know, because in Felicity I got a different impression, and I know that Felicity... Because it wasn't a comedy... It was soft porn. Uh, it was soft, but I mean, I saw this as soft porn. I mean, this is, <laughs> surely this is soft porn. Well, it's not, it's certainly not as... No, I don't think it is. You... Oh, okay. I mean, I'm not saying no one will get off on it because people, people get off, get off on it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But Felicity was certainly more erotically focused mm. than this film was. This film was certainly about sex, but Felicity, a much more of the driving exercise was to trigger the audience's sensuality as well as mm. simply portray some sex stuff in the story. Mm. Yeah. And for the most part, while there was this story going on, it wasn't supposed to engage you in the same way the humour is supposed to engage you in Alvin Purple. Mm. So this is not meant to titillate in that same way? You're not in the same way. I'm not saying that was... We don't see tongues. No, and that's actually what, it, what I was sort of getting to as well. I think that's that a line. A lot of the sex scenes... Well, I mean, I don't know. And I don't know whether this is just because porn is now on tap and he finds something very specific. None of the sex scenes seemed overly sexy to me from the point of view of titillation and let's make this look really erotic and really... Yeah, they didn't seem sexy to me either. You don't really? No. <laughs> no, and that's saying it's sort of saying before. Certainly there's nudity and sex there and certainly there's, mm. if you want a copy of you, there's more enough to go around, but I don't think it's the main point of it. Yeah. Right. So then we should be viewing Alvin Purple as a method of telling a story where sex is the undertone as opposed to let's have fun and let's enjoy sex. Because it's actually, this is going to sort of inform the way I come down on this film, as it were. <laughs> you didn't come down, enough. you didn't say go down. <laughs> so good. I think those two can work together. I just don't think the main point was to get you off, to get you no. wet and hard. No. Well, getting both sounds pretty unpleasant. Like, <laughs> well, it, it depends. It makes me think of concrete when it's wet and hard. <laughs> No, I think this movie is, like, respectable enough that you can, as a couple, go and see it and then go home and be a bit revved up, maybe. Yeah. I'd, but I'd... Except there is, no... <laughs> there is nothing... I, I'm not trying to say that Graham Blundell is an ugly guy. I'm not no. saying that at all. And, in he's... fact, I think we actually said he's one of the most attractive men in this film. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but he's not even meant to be attractive. He's no. meant to be, like... To borrow TV tropes. Oh, what? A gonk, someone who is not classically attractive and is notable as such. Yeah, 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 perfect. So, again, just as in most movies, there's probably not much for women to look at, but there's always more for men to look at. And that is the way that this Have you seen him these days? Proper Silver Fox stuff going on. Oh, really? Yeah, and as I said, I think insofar as if you think about people like, say, Hugh Grant as well, of that kind of bumbling, innocent-y type person, 
Graham Blundell, I think, even back then, is up there. I mean, we did actually comment on the fact that while the women were attractive in the ways of what they were looking for, there was absolutely nothing wrong with Graham Blundell. Did yep. you think that he was unattractive in the slightest? I reckon he... And he wasn't meant to have a giant cock. No. He was just an average guy. Okay, all right. The... It's a thing that... Yeah. Well, I mean, you can't... Sorry, you go. I was going to say... As a penis also... owner. But this is also... Well, this is something else as well. Uh, I don't know... As a penis... Sorry, have you got a question? I'm curious. I'm, I don't know what you were actually going for there. Because I was going to talk about the esoteric nature of his attractiveness, the fact that the very nature of the... When we were talking on the news reports, that those women are all around him. But his... just because you see him naked doesn't mean you know what it's like, you know? It's just doing growers versus showers. Absolutely. Meats versus bloods. Growers versus showers. Meats versus bloods. Meats versus blood. Okay. I get growers versus showers. It's the same thing. Meats for where did the meat? Oh, because it's just the meat it's versus once the blood's in there. Okay, who else is due for a cigarette? Pick me. <laughs> <laughs> what is it? Uh, it's a pin. If I happen to doze off, it just gives a short, sharp jab. It's nothing personal if I do it. It's just that I have this tendency to commit reverie. Commit reverie? Yeah, you know, go right off, drift away, up with the nimbuses and cumuluses and all the other little poofs of God. Oh, that's really beautiful. I've never been too good at keeping my mind on my work. And I work. I suppose if you are my therapist, mm, well then... Don't get me wrong, it's just a matter of me helping myself by helping you, if, if you get what I mean. Just letting out an intern. Nice. I love the intern. Does the cold shower thing actually work? I've never tried. I'm not a bloke. Oh, I didn't even think it would be... I didn't even think of it as a bloke. Well, it's just that... Oh, because you're pointing at both of us. I just thought it was a guy thing. Yeah. My understanding is that cold in general is meant to work in the ways that it sort of just retracts the blood. I am fortunate in that I've never been in a position where I have needed to take a cold shower... And more importantly, the practicality of being able to take a cold shower on the spur of the moment is not... With the best will in the world, if you've got the luxury of going somewhere, getting naked... You could just have a wank. Yeah. (laughs) I was sort of going to go (coughs) down that road. Sorry, you phrase that prettier. I was going to suggest that you can do many things to sort it out. And I mean, the question also about whether having a wank actually helps too, is that you already... I don't know. I just knew that cold shower was always the standby if you wanted to dehornify yourself. Yeah. I... Maybe I'm lucky or maybe I'm unlucky. It's really, for me in my life, it's always been if you just stop thinking about it for a little while. Yeah. Mind you, I think if he could stop thinking about it for a little while. We we wouldn't have a storyline. Yeah, no. Yeah. Isn't there also something about tensing your thigh muscles? I have heard that. Yes. Apparently, if you tense other parts of your body, the blood goes away. Well, actually, no. That was. I think it's because the thigh muscle uses the most blood. I think it's because it was in the TV show of The Rook. Ah. And I think it was in the book. I have heard the thigh muscle thing in the past from uh-huh. another, in another, like, I can't remember where it was. Maybe it was even, maybe Dr. Carl talked about it at one point. Ah. But yeah, the theory is, is that if you concentrate and you tense in other areas, the blood has to rush from somewhere else. The- so would eating one of those... Oh, Crazy those mega hot, hot Doritos. Chips. Uh, no, not Doritos, but the, yeah. The, the, the spicy sauce. chips, yes. You would be too distracted. Yeah, that and would it's... certainly work in taking your mind off, I think. <laughs> and you couldn't kiss anybody either. And you might have died. All of the above. Yeah. Yeah, I don't... I I think it's one of... I mean, again, I recognise that everybody's... Are you really put on the spot? No, no, not at all. Not at all. I'm happy to defend or not the male... I'll, I'll speak on behalf of the entire well, cis male I generation. Even, I didn't even think it was a male thing. I just thought it was a horniness in general thing. Yeah. He... I've never come across it, so to speak, as women in media. I always saw it, saw it was a male thing. Well, I believe... So, hardened nipples are one of those areas, but I believe the general, the general theory is that if a guy's turned on... They can't hide it. Whereas if a girl's turned on, technically speaking, you don't, you can't see it from outside. If they're, uh-huh, if, you, if you're uh-huh, both dressed, uh-huh. yeah. I didn't think it was about hiding it. I thought it was just about making it go away. Yeah, just make, curing your internal sensations of it. Well, oh, my... I don't want to be horny right now, regardless of whether I just. No, oh, it's no, just no. because you know, for so long, even now, some places masturbation was just looked on as a terrible, terrible thing. Yeah. So you're not meant to masturbate and get it out of your system. As it were. Yeah, exactly. Cold shower. Yeah. No, my understanding has always been what you are doing is you're physically treating the problem of being turned on because if you're turned on, you have an erection that is visible. Yeah, right. So... I think it's just all come from sex shaming. 
Oh, yeah, and it's all kind of nonsense, too. The fact of the matter is, I mean, I know that the being amusingly aroused in an inappropriate location is, you know, comedy gold, apparently, or at least comedy fool's gold, but ferric chloride, if memory serves. Anyway. Anyway. I, chloride? I think, is it ferric chloride? Is it fool's fer- gold. Fool's I'm gold? pyrite. I'm pyrite. Ferric chloride. What the hell's ferric chloride? I may have just made up a chemical. Go oh, you. Just get on that. Say discovered. <laughs> Yeah, I'm pyrates, you're right, yeah. Anyway, no, I'd always taken it as physically curing the problem of being physically aroused. Mm. And I'm also... In a non-progressive society. Mm. I don't know how far, how far to go down this road. Maybe we should talk about the film instead of your penis. Please. <laughs> that would be good. Because it was going into trouser bowls. Because <laughs> that's the other thing, and there are... There's... <laughs> No, I offered you an out, but no, you know, no, spread no, right no, back I'm, in. No, no, I'm going, I'm going to... I'm going to... Seeing it when Brooke's hearing us just no. laughing her butt off. No, oh, God, no, yes. No, no, I'm going to film, because that's the other thing, is the trouser bulge is another one of those kind of sight gag things that they can do, you know, and you get this jokey tent in the trousers that you see always, which has always struck me as weird, because, yeah, it's all about angles. Anyway... Long story short. So while he's acting as a quote unquote therapist, he's pouring them all pink champagne and then he disappears through pale <laughs> pink plastic velvet curtains. Oh yeah. Yeah, that is yeah. uh, I mean, okay, it wasn't Roger Deakins level cinematography, but that was some Cohen Brothers level delivery there. I actually thought that was really cool. And interestingly, Tim is it Tim Burstall or Alan Hopkins? Which of the came came from the artists an artist family? Alan, I think. Alan might be. There was a lot of reference to art in there, the, the art Oh, yeah, it was, it was fantastic. Which was amazing. Yeah. Some of the art pieces were great, and his preparation room as well is spectacular. Yeah. So I, thought, I really When we first that. saw the art, I thought he'd been drugged. I thought we were doing a drug scene. <laughs> I loved his speakers in his little... Oh, my God, how cool are they? In the set yeah. screen room. Floating cubes. I mean, basically, he, cool. he's being given missions, Mission Impossible style, which I thought was really and cool. The, those champagne glasses were delightful. The champagne were glasses were great. Nice. That was another thing that I remember thinking... Yeah, no, that's... yeah. Cold showers. Cold showers? Okay. Oh, we're back there again, are we? No, because he kept having them and then Hang he on. got... Hang on, touch of the fishy. Sorry, no. And then he got a cold and he went to the shrink's office with a cold and that just blew my tiny little COVID brain. Yeah! <laughs> that was so gross. Who would do that? There's... All it, the cold showers. Somebody was talking about this literally just the other day and I don't even know whether it was a conversation I was having with another person or a podcast... But the way we now have a, a visceral reaction to seeing people smoking inside, yeah, hugging is now becoming yeah. a weird, not a trigger because that's used in a in a particular yeah, yeah, yeah. term. But it's a thing when it's you see pushing. people, yeah, when you suddenly see strangers hugging or oh, strangers handshakes. hugging. Oh God, no, no, exactly. No. That's the thing. In I'm your, just like, like I can kind of cope with friends hugging. Yes. Yeah. It's janked our mindset already, yeah, and we begin to you register a, that. You want a big one? Go yeah. back and watch Batwoman and look how often people are touching each other's freaking faces. <gasps> oh, God, really? No. Each other's faces, not even their own faces. Yes. Oh, God. Because even now when I watch something, I, I just, I'm just like, no, stop touching your face. Yeah. It's weird. It's so strange that, yeah, we have become... And, I mean, you know, that's the same in the real world. I am already now... I'm now very aware of my personal space and as certain restrictions ease and people would get a bit closer to me in supermarket aisles and things, yeah, I'm you like... just turn around and buck. Fuck you. <laughs> but, yeah, it did. It was really strange, wasn't it? Yeah, the coughing. I remember you being kind of grossed out by, you know, coughing and sneezing, which, yeah. again, is another one of those ridiculous... I mean, that's pretty normal, but then you just add the, you know, global pandemic... Mm. Yeah, another one of those kind of classic sort of things, which is if you get cold and wet, you will have a cold. It's so strange. It's just, it was just a thing. I don't think it's entirely disproven, to be honest. Oh, really? Yeah. Is it about lowering your immune system? Yeah, because your body's fighting more to keep you warm. Okay. Mm. Mm. It also generally doesn't do you great if you're going through rapid temperature changes, which if you're going in and out of cold showers all day, probably you are. Yeah. Mm. I mean, that's a Looney Tunes thing, isn't it? I mean, if if you have a cartoon character standing in the rain, they will have a cold in the next sequence. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Weird. But no, the art was amazing. Sorry, yes. Yeah. The speakers looked fantastic there. Yeah, that, that weird little mission control section that he had in front of the mirror was really cool. And yeah, brought up little images in my head of Holly Motors. It's an amazingly abstract modern film about a guy who fulfills contracts from the back of a limousine. And when I say contracts, not like killing. He does stuff. He appears... Marital law, probate... 
I don't know. It's really hard to explain. But in one sequence, he will make an appearance as a drunk hobo in a graveyard and wreck a photo shoot with Eva Longoria. But and what's this called? What's the first word? How's it spelled? Holy Motors. H-O-L-Y. Because I was going to be saying holy with no. one L or holy with two. The holy, yeah, as in like the uh, whole grail. The holy without the W. And in, English is confusing. Yeah. And in the next sequence, he'll be a mocap actor. And in the next sequence, he plays an accordion. This is fascinating. A, it's I'm writing this down. Really fascinating. And in between, he's struggling with the fact that he's having a bit of difficulty with his estranged family or something. Yeah. And yeah. it's almost like somebody has said, let's make a movie where you've got a contract killer. Only every contract they're filling is not killing. It's some of the readers. Anyway, sorry. So, no, when Alvin's in that space of being delivered another woman, another woman, and he has to put on these personas each time and the therapist who we we know as inverted commas is not a therapist is describing what each of these women is about so i've got a question Uh uh-huh i wasn't sure how uncomfortable the notional concept of being forced upon the woman those sequences were from the point of view of alvin taking on the roles in question like the cave person or the that's the really tricky one yeah because she was she the ex-nun or is that a different woman she was a missionary that's the one and she had and later the fake doctor said i did paint rather a black picture of you <laughs> she was supposedly there to convert you yeah so he just raped that woman yeah and that's really interesting mm. because that's one of these ones that when you're writing the film in chronological order and you trust the therapist is being a therapist at this point because in, the impression we're getting is that all of the women are getting purple unique. treatment. Is, I the, think that's what they call it. Oh, isn't no, it? they had the purple treatment. Yeah, that I, that's, that's what they say. <laughs> <laughs> I've never had Bowen therapy, despite the name. I go as far as mangoes. <sighs> the Bowen technique is an alternative type of physical manipulation named after Australian Thomas Ambrose Bowen. There is no clear evidence that the technique is used for medical intervention, similar to the purple treatment, really. <laughs> so physical manipulation. Well, I so guess I'm clearly thinking of something completely different. It's actually chiropractic, so yeah, it's nonsense. Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah. Yep. We've just lost all the people into chiropractic. Okay, hmm. considering how many chiropractors there are and how many people listen to our podcast, then we lost no one. So yeah, in the context of the film, when you're watching chronologically, we believe at this point in time that Alvin is doing good, that a qualified therapist, who admittedly has been a bit creepy to his co-worker, but in general we believe is doing the right thing. Also, I don't think he was wholly creepy to her. I didn't get the impression that he's ongoing creepy to her because he did one thing and she called him out. Yeah, which so I, was I really don't. Yeah, no, that was kind of pro- cool. kind of progressive. Uh, yeah, yeah, he, I think he's. More of a clueless dick than a predator. Yeah, me too. Darius yeah, looking same. at me funny. Oh, no, you... You did get yeah. the same, yeah. Which was a, another really cool way of not... Especially once you view, view through the It's 1973. Exactly. Yeah, and, and uh, he, he seemed to absolutely value her thoughts and opinions. Mm. He said, no, you can't palm him off to me just because he's a man. Mm. And, you know... Yeah, and it was interesting because his response to her saying, please don't touch me, was explanation of why it was unnatural that she should be that way, but at the same time he physically moved back behind the desk, stepped away from her. So, again, if we're going to be a little apologist and give it 1970s cred, quite a progressive way of doing it, as opposed to doing the other way, which would have been no, and move in and start massaging the shoulders and say, you just need to get used to it and have her kind of relax. I thought that was... (sighs) Again, I mean, I know that this is not the film for it. More We're not trying to make it. More progressive current prime minister. I can't Yay. Ugh. Um, and I know this is not the film for it. It's not necessarily the intent, but I'm going to say Dr. Liz seemed to be a relatively progressive type female person until she then becomes the main villain of the piece. So, I don't know. What are you meant to take from that? Oh, yeah. Until she... Becomes the spurned lover. Spends a day with Alvin and... They get target shooting. Why does that woman have targets painted on her boobs? I have seen shirts like that. I don't mm. know why they exist. <laughs> My father. It, it surely anyway. seems, I mean, granted, I suppose, technically victim blaming, but it does seem literally putting a target on yourself is asking for trouble. Mm. Yeah, and, well, <laughs> when you're, especially when you're at the archery range. Yes. 
But yeah, then she spends the day with Alvin and he decides not to sleep with her and she oh, yeah, that's throws like, a wobbly. Yeah. So this movie's what, 93 minutes long? 90-something minutes. Mm. So after she throws a wobbly, because Alvin's saying, I'm cured. Yeah. That's 39 minutes in. Jesus. There's a fuckload of filler at the end yeah. of this movie. Which we'll get to with the court scene and uh, so on. Yeah. Oh, God, the skydiving. Fuck, I forgot about that. Shit. Sorry. Yes, there were some points when it began to start hitting the same notes as Stork with the going out into the wilderness and trying to get away from it all and being I pursued. I blessedly and... missed that one and the beautiful Ali stepped in for me to do Stork, so I didn't have to watch it. Oh, no, that's right. You never did know. I got to yeah. escape that one. About two-thirds of the way through Stork, Stork ends up in the country with his group and he comes in on a party that's happening and breaks it up in anarchist fashion mm. and then is getting pursued by everybody that was at the party and it struck very similar chords to me. It was when Alvin's out being pursued and then sort of jumps on a plane and goes skydiving oh, wow. in Mildura this hits, or something like that. This hits those beats. That's I, amazing oh, because this is so... It's from different just points. Just thrown yeah. together. The main difference is... When Stork does it, it's because, despite how he dresses up, he's a gigantic tool. Yes, that's exactly right. <laughs> Alvin is copying this because... Stunts were popular at the time. Yeah. And also, the husbands and what have you of the women he's been sex therapising are getting... <laughs> Great word. ...are getting <laughs> mad at him because, well... He's not a sex therapizer. Yep. Mm. Mm. <laughs> and, as I've speculated elsewhere, I don't think... I don't think McBurney was actually using any kind of sex therapy thing. I think he was just sending horny women over to Alvin yep. to get laid. Yeah. And then and that, film it and sell those movies on the blue market. Yeah. yeah. And that then completely changes the Because t- the now Alvin's a this. victim. Now, and... And, and he didn't even enjoy sex to begin not, with. And now he's being actively exploited. And also, as are all the women, I mean, quite aside from the fact that obviously they're unwitting porn stars, but any kind of suggestion that you might be having a crack at investigating what it is to have a particular sexual fetish or proclivity Mm. and to then enact that. You know, there's kind of people who go to these areas where you put spiders on your hand if you're an arachnophobe. Or, I'm not even a regular food, but I just freak the fuck out of that concept. Yeah. Or go to those fear of flying things where you end up actually going on a flight to try and get yeah. through it. Any, and again, this is one of those areas where it's like, how, how much were they thinking about what they were doing? Any potential lessons that you could argue the film is trying to give you during that sequence are then completely thrown out the window when it turns out that none of it came from any sort of... Scientific background, scientific because background, he's Even fraught. within the film, yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, you could argue whether or not the reality of the science is relevant. But, Dr. Mm. McBurney is a fraud. Dr. McBurney is a fraud. Dr. McBurney is a shyster. Mm. Which we only learn in the court scene where lawyer is saying to Dr. Liz... Do you think he'll be disbarred? Oh, no, not disbarred. Mm. That's lawyers. But struck off. Struck, struck off. off. Because I've got news for you, he won't be because he was never struck on. Yes. Um, and now it, was... And you're right, it was an equally weird delivery. Yeah. Because <laughs> was that the prosecution or the defence? Was that the guy defending I Alvin? I don't know. I, I, I don't remember. know what Alvin's actually charged with in this courtroom. Alvin's charged with being a gigolo. And this is another thing. And we might as well jump in the court. But thing surely because... that's not... A, like... Gigolo is not in the legal code. No, but this is the thing. So I am actually now going to... I'm going to deep dive on the court scene. Deep dive away. I don't think it's necessarily called gigolo in the legal code, but I'm pretty sure sex for money, call it whatever you want. Prostitution. Yeah. Yeah, and any of its names was still a crime there and then, so... Oh, yeah, yeah, it still is in a lot of places here and now. Yeah, so I think that's at least part of what he's charged with. And also, they say it's... Was he, it sounded more like he got like a stipend than a salary. It wasn't pay by case. He was paid hourly or something. I think no, something. he wasn't. Oh, wasn't he? Oh, right. Like okay. if he had a busy week, he'd be paid. Oh, more. that's right. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Oh, like, and, <laughs> oh my god. I oh, we need to get the handsome lawyer on this, Devon. Legal, legal. <laughs> yes. Yeah, but also, <clears throat> uh, I forget the words they use, but it's encouraging people to commit adultery. Yes. Like Which, citation or yeah, also a crime in 1973. Yes. Yeah. But apparently being 16 and fucking someone 28 wasn't a crime. Well, no. well, no one told the police. No. So I don't think, well... Do you think it was a crime? I was told it wasn't, but I didn't do any independent research. Oh, age of consent at the time was 16. In, oh, well, that's fine then. It was certainly incredibly icky, but I don't think it was an actual mm. breach of legal code. Yeah. And they didn't have that bracket point back then, did they? Which was that your age of consent could be within a window up to a certain age and then you were yeah, an adult. After that, no, I think... Uh. Okay. But 
I do know that in some places, age of consent is just once you're over. Hidden age. Yeah. Go at it. I don't know, because I just remember my youth growing up in ACT, and it used to be, you could be 15 if the other person is within two years mm. or anything, but mm. I don't know if that was just what people and that's said what I mean or by what the was actually true. I, I yeah, believe there right. is that bracket. I believe there's a, mm. a particular age bracket where, within that, the theory being that certain younger people will experiment, that if you are creating a healthy society, experimentation is a particular aspect of growing up. It's what's made mobile phone sharing of yourself very risky. Not from a legal point of view, it's very risky because technically speaking, the minute you send something, yeah, if you're if, underage... If I'm a you are, 14-year-old sending out a nude, I yes. am distributing child you are, Yes, it's, and, and yeah, it's That's fucked in no up. way completely and, messed up. No, it's one of the yeah. many ways anyway. that the legal system is not staying abreast of technology. Abreast. Oh, uh. <laughs> Jesus. You're right, we have swapped roles this time. Yeah, but obviously there is a significant... So recessed. It's the sort of relationship where you should not be having sex, which is the 16-year-old student and their... Headmaster's their partner. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Who also does not look 28. Everyone looks older than they say they are in this movie. Uh, oh, yes, right. yes. They look much closer in age. They do, yes. And as, yeah, it's kind of... Mm. But here's my take on the court scene. And it came from the fact that I realised that, again, Stork has a court scene. The Mm. film basically, Stork kind of ends with a court scene similar to this. Uh Stork is held accountable for all the stuff that he does and the determination is made as to whether or not Stork is a particularly reprehensible character. Yeah. And I was watching this going, my God, this court scene is hitting similar beats. Did we already say that Hexagon Productions was formed in the wake of the success of Stork? Hexagon Productions made this movie? I don't think we did. We didn't didn't point that out. So the makers of this film, yes. And this is interesting because they've decided to do it again. And initially I was looking at this and I'm going, they're being very apologist for themselves. They already think, you know, they have a wonderful time and then they feel the need to defend themselves. Well, actually, um, Barry McKenzie had a court scene too, didn't he? I've got a theory about this court scene though. Okay. Because it's too long. It's boring. Right. They bring out the projectors so they can show the blue movies, and there we go. We've got T and A in the courtroom. That actually feeds That's in... it. Nope. No. Nope. I'm going to go deeper than that. Dive deeper. Alvin is this film. Alvin is this film. Alvin, who is on trial, is this film being, being on, on trial. trial. Ah. Because what they are here to do is have sexy fun. It's the very early part of the R rating. This is the yeah. sort of stuff they say they want to make. They're going to have sexy fun. They know there'll be pushback. Sexy they fun know or it will funny be... sex? Column A, column B. We've already decided the funny sex is the realm of this film. <laughs> and they, in a kind of a preemptive attempt to justify the fact that at the end of the day, it's just harmless fun, and this is what you've now let us do. Except it's not, because we're talking about serious sexual assault. And this is the thing, and that's the problem, and it comes out in the court case... This is where I think they misstepped a bit. Yeah. Like, and and I will, because we'll never know, unless Alan personally tells us this is what he was going to do. Yo, Alan, hit us up. Alan Tweet was us. upset that Dr. McBurney was a villain. And, I- it, and the villainous of Dr. McBurney completely, as we've decided, completely turns it on its head. I suspect that in Alan's screenplay, Dr. McBurney is a legitimate therapist. Uh-huh, uh-huh. And what he is doing is doing good. And for whatever reason, they've decided to make him the baddie, make him a weird little kind of a, a creepy character. And as we've discussed, that completely changes all of the main part of the film. Yeah. But at the end, and they do because they find Alvin not guilty... I think they're trying to say, look, this is what we'll get from this bar rating. We have this tool to play with now. We're going to have some sexy fun. It doesn't hurt anybody. It's all about a romp. It's all about fun, and you've got to enjoy yourself. And don't get too hard. Don't get too upset about it. Don't get too hard. (laughs) Fuck. (laughs) Don't get upset about it. Don't be a prude. Don't be upset if it's not for you, the Liz sorts not getting Alvin's sort of thing. Oh, yeah, yeah. Just let us enjoy ourselves. And there's no harm to be had. And at the very end... No harm, no foul. No harm, no foul. And the judge finds it. The judge is shown as, well, let's see some more of these movies and where does one get with them? And I think that that We, we didn't little... actually just mention that the courtroom projectionist is John D. John D. Lamont. 
who, if you have by now, if you're listening if to this listen podcast... If you've listened to any of us, that bloke. Yes, yes that and bloke. if you've seen the exploitation doco, Not Quite Hollywood, John D. Lamont is the one who decided to be filmed in a strip joint because why the fuck would yeah. you in that context? And I genuinely think, and this is, again, this is a probably a way deeper dive than was intended in the movie, but it's certainly something I took out of it. Because I thought about the fact that three movies that we've seen now, two in your case because you haven't Stork, seen Stork, yeah. have a court scene where they basically put themselves on trial to a certain extent. And I think even Plug had a court scene too, Plug didn't had it? a court scene. It was, but, I mean, like everything else with Plug, it was... But they garbage. were meant to be cops and detectives and mm. shit. And another film that I got recently, which out of the UK, which was Preaching to the Perverted, okay. which was an exploration. It's a great film. It's an exploration oh, yeah. of the kink fetish scene in the late 80s, early 90s in the UK. In the UK? And it's an undercover investigation, and it will oh, eventually go to an indecency trial. And that's the thing. It's indecency trials. It's Is this the one with the gangbangs? Gee, from maybe. Never mind. Well, I mean, maybe. There's a lot of... of it, it's, I think I'm thinking of something real different. It's... No, no, no. I, I don't mean... Just ignore what I just said. There's whole sequences in underground sex clubs, so it's completely possible, but I don't know in the context of what you're saying, so I'll go maybe. What's your one called? Preaching, Preaching to, to the, the perverted. perverted. I've actually got it. I downloaded it. Oh, you mean uh, entirely legally off... Uh, no, program. I actually bought it. I bought oh, it... Oh, so video on demand. No, no, I bought the digital copy from their website. Good on you. And it's another one of these movies about obscenity and about people who don't get a particular sexual culture yep. deciding that it's wrong and evil and terrible and so let's go court. And I honestly think that clearer than in any of the other films, this court is about defending the film itself, preempting the... Because we've got Judge asking if there's any more porn to watch. Yeah. And in so doing, suggesting that even if... He's meta asking for his sequel. <laughs> hey, love that. Hey, look, the law wanted us to punch out a second one, as it were. But yeah, I... I zapped the law and the law won. <laughs> <laughs> and I wouldn't be surprised if in Alan Hopgood's original screenplay the court sequence was still there, mm. pretty much as it was. Because I would not be surprised if they felt that they needed to preemptively justify themselves. Okay. And so I'm going to... I'm finding that very interesting. I think Alvin represents the movie itself and that they put their own movie on trial and gave themselves a pass on It's Some Harmless Sexy Fun. Definitely shows the era that not brought up at all in the legal proceedings is any of the sexual assault we've mentioned. No. Yeah. Because, I mean, basically 20th century film, because any idea of sexual assault was overt and absolute monster people. Mm, yeah. Mm. But there's that whole subculture. I mean, you know, Back to the Future, one of my all-time favourite films. You can't get past the fact that Biff in the first movie is, is an attempted rapist. Yeah. Mm. And he becomes this bloody cucked car cleaner in the end of the film. Mm. And in, in this one, oh, the missionary who had rape fantasies and wants you to pretend to, well, wants you to pretend to be black people and rape her. Oh, mm. yeah. Oh, God, yes. Oh, thank God they the, didn't do blackface. These three white people didn't even talk about the racism until now. Yeah, no, oh, they didn't, but they he didn't was blackface. wearing some kind of animal. He was, but holy shit, that's, oh, my God, I but don't. But he was, Alvin Pepper was only told that she wanted to be raped, and she didn't. She was there to convert him. He raped her for real. Yeah, even if in, he didn't. In the film. Even if he didn't know he did, but when he finds out later, he doesn't go, oh, my goodness, what have I done? No, they both laugh. Yeah. And that's where I think... It does misstep. If you oh, take it very it, much does there. Yeah. If, if you take it, well, as we said, I mean, the making of this supposedly experienced person. I'm but really the bad guy of this whole film is something we barely see. Yeah. It's a bit like Dr. a Far Cry movie. A like game. a... Far Cry game. Far Cry games are terrible for that. They introduce the villain at the start, they introduce the villain at the end, and in between you see nothing. Anyway. <laughs> but, yeah. And I guess that's one of those things. It's They try to turn Dr. Salt into a villain, but... It's kind of weird. She just decides, well, I don't get to sleep with Alvin, so I'm going to take him to court. Well, it's yeah. kind of interesting. So she's rejected, then she goes, like, it's presented to us that she's rejected, and then she takes the legal route. She becomes a bitch, basically. <laughs> yeah, well, and yeah. the blackmail That's route so... in between. So yeah, yeah first exactly. a crime, and then apparently... She's blackmailing him, so he has to sleep with her. So yeah, so he, she's, she's also raping a him. rapist. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. There's not a lot of healthy... It's a very rapey this. movie... In certain... That's exploitation, baby! Yeah. Yeah. But through her actions, the truth is revealed about mm. the situation going on. She seems to get off scot-free. Mm. 
Oh, well, I guess we just actually, we don't know that. We just don't no. talk about her at all. She was never charged with anything, though she probably is now. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, after. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Alvin doesn't bring up the blackmail or the the rape, mm. which granted by internal story standards may not have been rape to these people. No. It totally is. I love that you're on trial and declared not guilty, and then you just run into the street, but then also you're closed. But you've got to have a run through the street. In uh, summing up, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I would like to point out that this trial has been one of the most um, enjoyable experiences in all of my 30 years on the bench. The accused and uh, all of those involved have um, unashamedly and in a commendably honest manner exposed to the public gaze all of those interesting, uh, not to mention fascinating ways that they uh, put in their time. Speaking as a judge, uh, I found it a welcome relief to the usual parade of wife beaters, drunks, tax evaders, etc., whose antics I find of um, no entertainment value whatsoever. (laughs) However, there are charges to be answered, and um, serious charges at that. Was Purple, acting in his capacity as higher stud, a therapist somewhat ahead of his time? Or... Was he merely pursuing the age-old trade of male prostitute or gigolo? What's he to be charged with? Incitement to commit adultery? False pretenses? Running a common bawdy house? And who is to be charged? On Dr. Salt's evidence, Purple was merely acting as an agent for McBurney, who, uh, as we all know, is not here today to face the court. You are failing in your duty if you do not instruct the jury to bring down a verdict of guilty. Indeed, madam, kindly be seated. Uh, Now then, we come to the matter of the manufacture of these blue films. If, as I believe to be the case, Mr. Purple was starring in these productions um, without his own knowledge, then how can he properly be charged as an accessory? (laughs) Once again... It's unfortunate that McBurney is not here in court today. You can't turn this man loose on society. He has preyed upon and exploited the affections of women all his life. Do calm yourself, madam. Be seated. He's a menace. Can't you see? He must be put away. These, then, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, are the facts you must remember when you go to consider your verdict. Is the accused guilty of the crimes with which he has been charged, or is he guilty of merely being used by the man who committed the crime? So... We were talking about the sales pitching. Yes. Yes. And it turns out, as is often the case, that I went away with a completely different take on the sequence than, in this case, both Daria and November. So what we have, as we were talking before, is we have a series of montages. So we have Spike, who is the mustachioed friend of Alvin, doing a a spiel in in a shopping mall. Yeah. Talking through... It's one of those demo things you sometimes see... That's the intern falling off a fucking table because bad at cat therapy. Oh. Sorry. Yes, yes, it was you the gra- okay, baby. it was the grounds fault. That's why we should oh, look at the, the ground for a while. She yes. stood on a book and it slid out from under her. Uh, oh, what the fuck hell? you, gravity! Oh yeah, we were totally right. We totally meant to do that. Yeah. So we have a montage of basically this long sequence where he's spruiking the mattress in a shopping mall. Yeah. People are around him. This is the point we were talking at the very start of the film with a terrible canned laughter that doesn't Ooh. look anything like what's coming out of the mouths of the audience. And in between, you get a sequence of Alvin selling the beds by basically setting them up in various ladies' houses and then having sexual encounters with the women. And it's about sealing the deal. About I think even one or two of them even says, you know, I might decide not to buy your That's the first one, isn't it? The first woman who she's complaining about how long it's taking him to fill the waterbed up. He says it'll just be another few minutes and she goes to change us into a negligee. Yeah. Now, so my take from that, and it was one of those ones where I was joking about the time difference, because as we discussed before, to fill a bed, to get it set up, and then to empty a bed again is going to be hours. So you, if you genuinely are going to demo a water bed in someone's home, you're basically going to do two demos a day if you're lucky. So I'm picturing that he's got some, like, 
little truck with suction and water plumbing facility. So he can rapid, facility, rapid fire. And they're just doing it through the window. Actually, no, because he no? actually tells the first oh, woman that it's, it's the, the water, water pressure. pressure in her apartment or her house. Yes, so damn. Anyway, so I took it as a sort of a time irrelevant montage competition between the two sellers, which was that Spike is in the mall failing. The reason yeah. that there's canned laughter is that people are joking because he looks so uncomfortable when he's trying to do it. He just doesn't seem to be moving any mattresses and it, as it were, and that nobody's <laughs> really particularly interested and they're mocking him. Meanwhile, Alvin's well, doing an incredible... So I thought the canned laughter was just for the terrible, terrible innuendo. Lull yourself on a cushion of sensuality. You'd go right off, I tell you. It's ideal for insomniacs, spinal sufferers, invalids, and a few other conditions of the human body I could mention. <laughs> Any questions, ladies? Oh, well, that's probably true too. So, yeah. Mm. And so in between that, Alvin's going door to door and doing an amazingly good job because he's basically shagging his way to success. I almost had a whole Glengarry Glen Ross vibe from the two of them competing almost for sales and Alvin doing amazingly as a bit of a joke on the fact that Spike was the one who kind of led him into it. So that was my take, was that they were actually operating in context. I absolutely didn't say. As the other mate said, they needed a two-man team. Yeah. Yeah. And I took it that Spike was actually engaging with the audience, that as Dodge is the Canned Laughter was, it was supposed to represent the audience laughing with him, not Positive at vibe. him, mm. and getting in on it. He was being engaging enough to get some orders, some bookings, some however they're running it, and it off those orders that Alvin then goes and visits these houses where he installs the waterbed and has sex on them, which seals the deal. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And I thought it was anachronic order enough that Spike stuff is only taking place maybe over one or maybe two demo sessions. Yeah, that yeah. makes sense. Presentations, whereas Alvin's might be spaced out over days or even weeks. We're seeing the result of his... Yeah, which actually makes a lot more sense. Yeah, I don't know why I got such a different take on that. Spike is redundant in this. Because if I completely you just agree with you because Alvin... Like, they described in the movie as a two-man job, but they they just had Alvin one or two days a week doing the public spruiking. Mm. Then, you know, we've learnt that every woman, except the one he's in love with, every other woman wants to sleep with Alvin. So if he just did the spruiking one or two days a week, mm. then he could spend the rest of the time installing and fucking and selling. And that's, yeah, and I guess maybe... Or whoring. Whoring is an, yeah, another word <laughs> whoring. for it. I mean, and that's what Alvin... And that's actually, I suppose, the point. As soon as we establish who Alvin is and what his superpower stroke curse is, mm. any employer, for want of a better word, in inverted commas, is basically whoring him out because they're using, they're taking advantage of him. Yeah. Which, yeah, again, you could go a massive deep dive on that, the fact that it's the male character that's being... I mean, imagine if he, like, an employer wouldn't, hire him if that employer also happened to have a hot wife because they would meet at some point and of course Alvin would well actually no do the men understand what's going on no yeah, they oh you don't oh, think... hang on in what sorry which men in what context sorry the men in this movie do they understand that Alvin is irresistible to women oh <sighs> we don't really get their input <clears throat> Like, we get one man's input, McBurney, mm. and, and we the kind news, of get Spikes. The news reader. Yeah, and Spikes is more of a, I don't know how you do it, mate. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, this... and what about Dad? Who gives the weird-ass speech at the 21st? I think that's meant to be that's unintentional to be innuendo, even though Roger and Spike and everybody else are kind of just sort of, you know, looking yeah. at each other and, and going, hey. Yeah, and McBurney's obviously got insight because Alvin's told him in so mm. many words. So I'm guessing this is just men can't understand why Alvin is yeah. so attractive to women. Yeah. And actually, and Roger this... eventually bursts out laughing at the end of the speech, doesn't yeah, he? Yeah, he does. Like, that's when you see he has all the fillings. That actor has his entire <laughs> mouth is black 1970s fillings. Oh, yeah, well, there's a lot of fillings in these movies. Yeah, yeah. But... I was going to say, yeah, Spike's reaction is, this point, Alva's more like, as I said before, often in real life you'll have this friend who bears no classically attractive qualities, be they physical or behavioural, mm. and yet are knee-deep in dick or pussy or both or whatever. Yes, yeah. the genitals of choice, as it were. But the people I know like that, it's because they're funny and charming and outgoing and talkative. People in real life? Yeah. yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah. Um, some people in real life not... don't have that and it just mm. seems to keep happening. Oh, really? 
So I, I think when Spike's like, I don't know how you'd do it. At this point, it's still sort of a, mm. it's weird, but this really happens to you. Or and is the, I don't know how you do it, the, I don't know how you keep up with doing it. That's what well, I took. another thing. Because that's, yeah. that's what, what I took from that. that. I actually was going to say that with the exception of the husbands that are done as the joke in Car Chase, let's go yeah. into the action sequence of this film, as opposed to the action sequence. Of, sorry. <laughs> none of the friends, none of them are any of the whole half your bloody luck, this is so unfair... They yeah. all genuinely seem to be man. That's not necessarily that. Yeah, they're not understanding. Unhappy. Yeah, and they get that. Uh, whereas I don't know if this is sort of explicit, but it seems like the men are in relationships, or some of the men are in relationships, and that's working well for them. But Alvin's plight, being uh, irresistible, mm. is a tr- well. Yeah, not a trap, but uh, no, certainly more than inconvenient. Yeah, and it's a curse. It's played as a curse. And this is I, and I just I've, I mentioned before that I watch too much young adult fiction, but it's like that if were a love curse or a sex curse were placed on Alvin, that would make sense now. Yeah, yeah. Or well, just peeking ahead to the other two films I've seen, which I haven't watched properly again lately, but have seen enough of to gather this. In parts of the later films, it's almost like a supernatural thing, yeah. mm. especially in the third one. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so I've been hearing stories about that. Yeah, mm. looking, not looking forward to that third one. But, because that was what I was going to say, is again, and without knowing where Alan was actually going with the original plot, given the fact that McBurney as a good guy actually harnesses the power of Alvin, because <laughs> Alvin's coming to him saying this is a curse and Bernie says you can use it for good. You could almost argue a, a Dumbo, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer subplot to this. I'm going to need more information What's on that. taken as the curse, you know, the big gears that are terrible, all the bright red nose uh-huh. that sets him apart, at the end of the story arc becomes well, the be making money hand power of good. You just wanted to use the hand over fist, didn't you? I only just thought of it, and yes, I did. Good God. <laughs> Good God. But, yeah. Well, uh, it could have been if he'd been an actual sexual surrogate and not just been pimped out exa- for exactly. secret blue movies. Another yeah. one of those things. And knowing that... I mean, the doctor said the women were being satisfied, but we don't know that. He's lied about everything else. Yeah. Well, I get the impression just from the background and periphery stuff that... Some of them, at least, were being satisfied. By yeah. Them. Not people who were being tricked like the missionary, but no. some were definitely going and getting a bit of Alvin action and coming out satisfied. And yeah, that. especially the... Who was, which was the, the, the actress with the... We're just leaving the, that... The German action. No, never mind. No, 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 no. no. I, was, I was actually sort of leading into that, which is the actress with the German coming accent. Coming out satisfied. Oh, coming out. <laughs> My God. I thought right she that said point. that on purpose. Did you say that on purpose? No, I didn't. Okay, oh. no, I <laughs> Not everybody. We're just ignoring hand over fist. your pun. No, I missed, we- missed this one. <laughs> <laughs> Because, yeah, I mean, you've got that accented... I think she's got a German accent that she's putting on where she's like, no, I will call the police, I'll call the police, I'll call the police. Oh, yeah, yeah, And then she goes, please, 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 which is... What are you doing, Alvin? Unbuttoning my blouse, Alvin. I'll have to call them. I'm quite serious. This goes on. For one minute more, I will call the police. Alvin, you are undoing my skirt. You realize you could be charged for that? Take your hands off my bra, Alvin. I'm warning you. I'm quite serious. I will call the police. You know, the idea is that it's all that no, 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 doesn't mean no, which is... Yeah, and they've even got the don't take my shirt off woman is doing bad, bad acting. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, like don't take my shirt off. So the way of signalling to us that... Take my... Yeah. That this is play acting even within the world of the Oh, I really liked your skirt, by the way. Yeah. (laughs) Oh, you did? Because it's like a a rappy skirt kind of thing. It was, yeah. It looked like meters material. But yeah, you know, she said, I'll call police, I'll call Mm. police. And she does. At the end, she's saying, please, please, because police, please. Did you not get that? Okay, no, I didn't get that until this exact moment. So the actual unwitting rape aside, because that's what the movie does with it, if we assume in context that the women are actually getting sexually satisfied, then... Are there orgasms in this movie? No! And that was actually something else. So why else are we was... assuming anyone's getting satisfied? Well, this Not is... that I'm saying that the goal of sex is an orgasm. Yeah. But that... once he's fucked a chick, we don't see them again. 
No, and they're never brought in as evidence. No, they're none not. Of them are, none of them are brought in. The trial is literally about... What if about... fucking Alvin Purple is really disappointing? We wouldn't know because we never hear from the women again, except for the therapist, and she's seeing him before she starts shagging him. And the him. teacher, who he was nearly going to get away from, and then after a series but of bumbling... he was bumbling... 16 years old. I think she's going to give allowances for poor performance. Well, no, she keeps so letting him back. effort. Yeah, she, he's going back again. And Remember, again. the bike keeps changing. No, it doesn't. Okay, so the bike keeps upgrading yeah. every time he rings the bell and goes to the garage, and the one time the bike is actually upgraded, that's when the door doesn't open. That's ah, a different style of bike. Okay, right. Yeah, but he's still going back more than once. Yeah, yeah. until he's the husband finds out. It's obviously not such a terrible experience that she ditches him forever. Yeah. Unless it's the whole, like, I'll teach you thing, or, mm. oh, what's the words I'm looking for. It's not like quite Florence Nightingale syndrome, but... Oh, the, the bringing the boy into manhood. Yeah, something yeah, like that. There's one of the songs that, that Doug Anthony Allstar sung on their album, Blue, was... I don't, I don't know. I'm the... just thinking right now of Rocky Horror Show. Oh. I'll make a man out of you. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. But that context. And yeah, again, yeah. this is another one of those areas where society even today still struggles with the concept of uh, a female... Also, she's married to a headmaster. How good could his shagging be, honestly? <laughs> Headmaster um, at a private school, he's probably repressed. <laughs> <laughs> Where society, even in this day and age, I'm not even... I'm going to let... No touch of the No touch of the fishy. You can make that old <laughs> massive one. But, yeah, where society even now really struggles with the fact that an older person preying on a younger person is bad no matter what the genders, where you still get, if it's a young boy being brought into sexual awakening by a female... Can we say young man? Because young boy sounds like he's five. No, 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 that's my point. Young boy being brought into sexual awakening by a female of an older age as opposed to a young girl being preyed upon by an older male. It's still, even today... No, the terminology is really bugging me there. No, but that's the point. That's what I'm trying to say. Society still even now struggles with the fact that a child being preyed upon by an adult is a child being preyed upon by an adult. Uh And if you have a female teacher preying on a male, a young boy, there is always a portion of society that goes, oh, lucky kid getting shown the ropes by the really experienced, you know, he'd be like Can I guy say, was... just suggest that portion of society generally blokes? Mostly, occasionally they're Miranda fucking divine, but, you Oh, know. dear God. Yep. How did she get that surname? And, Honestly. yeah, and if it's a male on a female, or, oh, God forbid... Uh, same sex, yeah, that's really bad, but my, apparently a boy... My being... only issue with your argument was you said young boy and young girl versus young woman and young man, because you say young boy, young girl, I'm picturing six years old. Young woman, young man, I'm picturing 15, 16 years old. That was my only complaint during that. Yeah, okay, all right, cool, yeah. So my point is that they struggle with that, and that's kind of a subtext of the whole film, which is that it's okay if you're a boy, yeah, as we know. A, a, a guy, a male. Anyway... The movie. The movie. The fun film. About. Yes. And not the pedophiles. So you know how I, like, when there is, like, a newspaper or advertising in the background to check that out? So in this, there's a newspaper called the National Times, which was apparently huge in the 1970s. It was really political. I vaguely remember the tail end of that one's existence. Really? Okay. Oh, oh, oh. So when Alvin and Tina and a couple of Alvin's male friends are hanging out at the pool, once he's exhausted by all the sexing he's doing and male fraud therapist says, take a break. So it was such a confusing, it was like a personal sound. It was really confusing to hurry up. Hey, listen to this. Canberra Bearded Dragon, 31. Seeks musical, literary, or linguistic dragonette. Beardless but sexy. <laughs> How does that appeal to you, Tina? I like the linguistic bit. <laughs> what about this one? I am packed off with one night stand. Sounds like you, Alvin. Shed off with shallowness. Quiet camp guy, 25, would like to meet couple under 30. Willing to dally discreetly during daytime. Status looks unimportant. <laughs> Any takers? What on earth would they do? Well, it cost you a dollar to find out. Ah, uh, yeah, the 1973 Craigslist. Yes! <laughs> it was <laughs> really weird. Because, yeah, a friend and I listened to it twice, and I still don't know what went on in that. Yeah, it's... Was that when they were all in the pool, or...? That's it, well, yeah, yeah, that's exactly yeah. it. Yeah. And yeah. so one of them is sitting on the oh, diving yeah. board, which just gave me line? terrible flashbacks of Last Man on Earth, 
because, well, yeah, he's the last man on earth and he just goes into through the rich house, but he turns the pool into a toilet. He, in the diving board, cuts a circle out around it to become a loo. Yeah, It's really gross. But then he didn't think anyone else was alive. Yes. And other than that, it's really cringy and it's really fucking funny. And there are DeLoreans. Hey! <laughs> Yeah, it was the line was like, camera, sorry. wasn't it? It was Yeah, yeah, I listened to that twice, did you, Dario? Did it say Canberra? I thought it said Canberra. Yeah, same. Yeah. Like the first word was Canberra. Yeah, it was Canberra Canberra something or other. Yeah. Yeah, yeah but you, you probably heard the audio by now. Yeah, it was really weird. I don't know what that was meant to be. I don't know whether Canberra had the reputation of porn back then. Well, it's Tina didn't know what's going on either, and he says, it only cost you a dollar to find out. Yeah, that's true. Canberra always, well, not always, but had a reputation for porn for a really, really long time. I think it's part of being a territory and not a state. And part of having a whole bunch of politicians. <laughs> yeah, that. <laughs> so, yeah, I was going to say, there is this concept of it's okay if it's a guy. There is an Australian movie called The Book of Revelation, which is really good, which is about a, a guy who's captured by a cabal of female sexual predators who hold him hostage for a, a couple of weeks and basically use him as a sex slave. How then... can I Google the book of Revelation? Oh, it's really easy. You'd be fine. How bad can it be? <laughs> but it's got Deborah Malman in it, so Deborah Malman's a good anchor point to go searching for it. Yeah. And the serious exploration of being held prisoner as a guy, being used sexually aggressively, and then attempting to try and get a, you know, taken seriously while at the same time everybody around you is like, you know, half your bloody laugh. Yeah, and you know, and I'm just going to Which... cross this shit out now because I know that toxic masculine movie that's just all over that bitch and... It's actually a very interesting... But yeah. I but don't that's not necessarily you. what they're going for with Alvin Purple again. I think it was less about trying to make a serious point. Well, I don't know. I can't speak on behalf of the... But it seemed to be less about serious point than more about this is an interesting spin on let's have some sexy fun times. So... I think by now we've talked about anything that could possibly be interesting with this film. Uh, we did footnote that Dr. Sort is played by the mom from the Sultana brand adverts. <laughs> what? <laughs> what? Remember the long-running Sultana brand adverts about the family who would be having breakfast or whatever and the and then, teenage son was always like, I wouldn't get into healthy stuff and then would be eating Sultana brand and the other members of the family, mostly the mom, would be exchanging oh, looks. Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yes, classically trained veteran actor Penny Hackforth Jones. Uh, Yay! Known to a generation as the mom from the Sultana brand effort. <laughs> that was a Fine quite interesting GTO, discussion GTO. that I had last night watching this film because Alvin Purple was allowed to sound like an Aussie, but none of the women were. They all had that received pronunciation BBC shit going on. I don't know how big a thing that was necessarily for this film because I remember that being a thing even up until things like... Yeah, bloke could... Speak like an Aussie and the women couldn't. Oh, yeah, Tina okay. didn't speak like November. No. Fuck no. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> No, I that's mean, true. They're all very... oh, sorry. Abigail gets a pass because she's actually born in Britain. Yes, right. that's fair. Yeah. But, yeah, I suppose you're right. But, I mean, again, was that... The blokes that... get to be ochre and the women have to be classy. Actually, that's a really good point. I'd never really kind of thought about that before because it's not until... God, it's not even until people like... Because you like, didn't spend $13,000 studying linguistics. That degree's <laughs> come in handy. Yeah, well, you remind me of the story that Adam Savage tells about going to see Six Sense with a, a woman in industry costume who's designer. a costume designer and basically has the entire movie spoiled in the first 10 minutes when she's but sitting there and But I heard that problem too, but it just didn't occur to me. Yeah. So I just thought they were being kind to someone who can't remember faces. Yeah. Yeah. Well, no, the, well, I just Bruce Willis wear the same outfit the whole time. Yeah. So basically, um, after about from five minutes, she's like, he hasn't changed his outfit once yet. And instantly Adam's like, oh, and realised, yeah. And I just didn't get that was meant to be a twist at the end. Because they're both like, we know the movie's about a kid who talks a ghost. This cunt just got shot. So that's, mm. that's it. I yeah. had it pre-spoiled, so I don't know how it would have gone. <laughs> okay. But for me, it was like Angel and Buffy when it's suddenly revealed he's a vampire and like, Oh, shit, I thought he was a vampire for the past seven episodes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Callum. Um, yes. Did you first watch that movie with me? No. Oh, so you'd seen it before. Or Six Sands? Yeah. Yeah, no. No, I had seen it before. Yeah. Sorry, that was our first ever date. I invited <laughs> Callum around to my place and I cooked. And I can't believe we got together after that. Couscous oh, with... Well done. It was couscous and with a... And you hate couscous and I didn't know. Yeah, it was couscous with a jar of sweet and sour canton sauce. Oh, was it? Yeah. That's so fucking tragic. No, 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 no. It was really cool. I, 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 for some reason, it stuck in my brain. <laughs> you say your parents but, got together, mate. <laughs> <laughs> 
And can we just point out that, that we, we are did now... not birth kittens? And also that we have now been happily not together for eighteen years. Eighteen years. <laughs> and I'm now deeply, madly in love with my new fiance, who is a stunning goddess, who people not ironically call Wonder Woman because she's, she's amazing. Amazing. Anyway, well, when I refer to the Amazon, no one ever says, "Who are you talking about?" <laughs> <laughs> But, yeah, so... Where are we at? Where are we at? <laughs> okay, so we finished the court case, and then we've got a car chase because action scenes were fashionable. He's trying to escape his... The husband pers- of his clients. Yes, mm. pursuing him in vehicles, and he pulls up outside a mini aerodrome that I do skydiving and so seconds later he's on his way in the plane to do his first ever skydive mm. now i just want to double those check. scenes don't need to exist at all not at all and i will actually say that if you look up rego of the aircraft it is still flying <laughs> now this shit when we hang um, out. what can i say but did they pull a point break on this is that genuinely graham blundell who gets thrown out of the plane because I'm not I, clever enough to know the answer to that. Daria? There is a single shot, because obviously we're talking low budget, and so we're not at that point where you've got steady cams that can actually... Yeah, get, yeah. But I genuinely think that it seemed like Graham Blundell was in that position all the way up, and you see him definitely talking, and then it does appear like they throw him legitimately oh, out of the Oh, because he's in disguise, so he's got the long wig, and that explains yeah, the stunt he's driver. he's a, a hippie. But we do see his face when he's diving, don't we? Yeah, yeah we do. just that only Look, sequence. Diving, yes. Driving, it seems to be cut with a stunt yeah. driver, but not with a stunt yeah. well, in, skydiver. In the, in the BTS from the time, with a deep watch all the way through, there is stuff showing the stunt driver, but also, I guess it's Tim Burstall describing how they had to get the necessary well, dialogue for what it was. Mm. On the way down, which only gives them a fairly quick window. Oh, yeah, well, yeah, wouldn't it? So the bit where he's, he's pleading, and I didn't. Is there so a... he he might have actually done that. It That's seemed to me... pretty cool. I must admit, I didn't get a chance to watch this with any kind of director's commentary or a commentary track on the DVD that we watch. And the DVD is probably different to the Blu-ray. I wonder whether or not Graham Blundell did actually jump out of the plane. I don't think it's a commentary. But this was the making of them actually made in 1973. Hmm. Which oh a, yeah, yeah, yeah. A BTS done by our favourite BTS. Maker. BTS behind the scenes, not a K-pop band. But in this case, it is also the other BTS because Brian Trenchard Smith directed this. Oh, yes, of course. He directed the the behind-the-scenes video. (laughs) (laughs) So, yeah, we've got a couple of bits of royalty here. Tim Burstall's certainly not done uh, small things either. So, yes. Yes. Brian Cash. How many levels of director inception does this go? Yeah, and Brian Cash. Direct inception. I will point out, or at least I've deep-dived on Alan Hopgood as what he was intending. And I know there was a bit of bad blood between the two of them, but let's not... You can't downplay what Tim Burstall managed to achieve with this because, you know, he raked in a significant amount of money with this film. And I have shat over this film a bunch of times, but by the end, where his would-be girlfriend is a nun and he's a gardener in the nunnery, (laughs) I actually want to see the next one and see what happens next because I really like the ending. (laughs) Is that lame? It's it's like he really is God's gift to women. Yeah? Ah! She didn't even plan that. Love it. (laughs) (laughs) Gift to God's women? (laughs) Love it. Well, there we go. So also, apparently, you just become a nun. Yeah, you, you can Oh, just, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you would decide, I want to be a nun, and so therefore... No, you, you just chuck the headgear on and you're good. You've uh, probably got a black dress lying about. Yeah. You don't. You own dresses. I never see you in dresses. You see me in skirts. Skirts, yeah. but not dresses. Well, I don't have many dresses. I've got a few. Okay. So, yeah, anyway... anyway. The only other thing I was going to say, and I'm not going to deep dive on this one, but the other thing too, this concept of Alvin, let's get somebody who's not particularly sexy or good looking because that way men won't find it particularly... It's the Ron Jeremy thing. That's exactly the name of I was going to... Of course it was is. literally the name I was going to bring up. Because yeah. the point is we're still talking very early 70s where a male actor's performance ability was more important than the way they looked. Yeah. Coming back to the idea that a woman can be... It was a pre-Viagra age for yeah. men. A woman can be aroused or not aroused and it's not technically going to show. 
show, a male has to be aroused to a certain point to perform. Mm. And yeah, if your male porn stars at the time look like Ron Jeremy, is it really that subversive to have an every man as your sexual magnet? Because but they also say in the modern interviews that they didn't want to put up, or maybe it was the contemporary interviews, they say in some of the interviews mm. that they didn't want to put up a traditionally good looking stud as being attracted to women because that's boring. Mm. Or is that too challenging to men? I think there was actually there was a, a bit of that too. Yeah, there was definitely a vibe that if the, he was an amazingly handsome... Because if you're handsome... not superstar attractive, yeah. like Ron Jeremy is not superstar attractive, doesn't that enable men to put themselves in those mm. shoes? But I guess you could also argue that the point of the whole film is that it, it's an ineffable attraction. Nobody understands where it comes from or what and it's that's about. True. That's, and that's That's what point. this movie all is. Right. Yeah, all right, yeah. cool. Nice. But I still thought it was quite Ron Jeremy porn-like. Yeah, well, actually, that was a little thing I wrote down when I was watching the film. It's like... Eh, I am not going to look up when Ron Jeremy started doing porn because I don't want to fucking know. No, and also, yeah, like so many other people, he's problematic now. Oh, flashback, I finally watched that Batman Triple X parody, the one of Batman 66. Oh, God, oh, God yeah. Yes. Well done for making it through that. Oh, did on. you make it through that? I did. I dropped the one of the actual sex cut out. Oh, cool. Excellent. Just Fantastic. The, just the parody parts. Thank but you, Christian editors. I think this is the, so we can put it on YouTube mm. and show people. Uh, same with, same uh, with Doctor Who. We can do stuff. Are but you the, telling me there's a version of Doctor Who that's full of sex? Because tell me which Doctor I want to watch the fuck out of that. We've had this conversation a couple of times on this podcast. Oh, yeah, we yes, have, there is. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. But they do a parody of the climbing up the wall and encountering a celebrity out the window thing, and the celebrity is Ron Jeremy. Love it. <laughs> nice. But no, yeah, there is. There's a Doctor Who porn parody, and yeah. you've got all the yeah. porn cut out on the YouTube track. It does seem almost juvenile, even by porn standards, that he's called a sex lord instead of a time lord. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that's just really lame. It, like, like my first thought is calling someone an edge lord. Yeah. So just get that. That would have been cool. I love you, Alvin, but I could never marry you. Well, you must admit your history doesn't make you a very attractive marriage prospect. That's all in the past, Tina. Give us a chance. Do people really change, Alvin? It would take a lot to convince me. So, yeah, it feels like we're mostly done. I don't know that we actually mentioned the budget. $202,000, which includes... Actually, no, we didn't mention this, and it's quite yeah. interesting. Sorry, you go, and then I'll jump in. Okay, $202,000 in total Australian at the time, of which part of that budget was indeed the marketing budget as well. So that's full budget, which is unusual, because normally when they talk budget, they're only talking what it costs to physically make And there the was a small portion of that, which was government money, which was repaid before they started screening. Yeah. yeah. And the total rake-in was just shy of $5 million, $4.7 million, which was a huge... So film. it knocked off the previous film that had made that much money, and we will cover this at some point, so that's... They're a weird mob, They're aren't weird they? Mob. And that was the 60s. So oh. that's it for a while. There's this movie, and it only got bumped off top dollar by Crocodile, Crocodile Dundee. Dundee. So, oh, that yes. That much later. So, yeah. So, yeah. So Alvin Purple held the record yeah, for the huge, most that's a profitable huge Aussie film. amount of time. Yeah, for a significant portion of time. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, in this day and age, people watch it. It's got 5.7 stars on IMDb, currently 42% on Rotten Tomatoes, because if you watch it with a 2020 sensibility, it's a bit shit. <laughs> but, yeah, depending I mean, on what you want to take is, from it. And I tried to watch this twice, and I know I say this about everything, but I'm just like, oh, uh, I was just there one day, and like, okay, I'll chuck this on. And then I was in the sort of fantasy scene in the bus at the start. Like, yeah, I'm just <laughs> switching that off. Well, and we not do that all the time. But by the end of it, I wanted to see more. I wanted to see what happened next. And oh. that's not happened before in these films, I don't that's think. That's true. You don't want to see Plug 2. <laughs> oh. <laughs> but it did actually bring up the concept My eyes of... rolled back in my head so far. I can see the upside-down manga section. <laughs> you have an upside-down manga section. But, no, but there's a manga section behind me in this room, uh, and my is. eyes are upside-down. That makes sense. That would be the Agnam section. Thank you, Callum. No worries. He was watching colour television. That's weird for 1973. God, it would have been, wouldn't it? Australia didn't get colour television until 1974. They were watching colour TV? Where? The when? news. When Alvin was watching... Well, fuck! Alvin and Tina were watching the news thing about himself. Oh, that didn't cross my mind. That's amazing. Yeah, we didn't have okay. colour TV then. 
Certainly the consumer has a wide variety of colour sets to choose from. There are some 40 models made by the five to six manufacturers. This set is a 13 inch selling for around $550, the smallest in the range, although if you did shop around you could find one for a little under $400. The middle of the range is around $750 and uh, this is a fairly sophisticated one enabling you to change channels at the touch of a button. And that of course the very last word in color television, this Nord Mender from Germany. It enables you for $1,400 to change channels at the touch of a button. And you don't even have to leave your armchair. We got color TV in 75, I thought. Could well have been they rigged it up knowing color television was on its way in mm. and they just... Industry insider. Yeah, and it was probably fairly well known that it was on its way. I mean, mm. other countries had had it for years by this point. Yeah. So they probably did that to date the film a little less. Unless yeah. they post colorized it? I mean, that's really unlikely, yeah. but... No, chances are they just used a color set that they yeah. had access to and just yeah. made it themselves, but... Kind of wow! Bill Bryson wrote about the fact that when he visited Australia, part of the place he went to didn't get color television until 1990-something, so... Oh, that was incredible. <laughs> yeah. Oh, there was, I think, a couple of other things I noticed was that at least two or three of the cars were all Valiants, which, uh, including the one where he disguised himself so that he looked like somebody else and then made a point of burning out of the driveway. Oh, so completely... that was when he, he put on a wig so he looked like a long-haired yeah. hippie. But no one actually looked at him because he just ran out of the place yeah. and sped that car down the street. Yeah. Canberra Bearded Dragon was the Canberra term. Canberra Bearded Dragon. Was the term that was used during the... Ruddy, you know ad. all things fetish. <laughs> Maybe not all things, but most things. <laughs> bearded dragon, does that mean something to you? No. Well, beard well, not does, even as but... a 70s historian? Mm. No, I was going to say, apparently I only know most things fetish, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> and we're only born in the late 70s. Mm. Yeah. Dr. Liz, Dr. Alvin in 56 minutes out of 132 minutes, and the movie should have stopped within 10 minutes <laughs> of Maybe that. ties into your he's not actually very good thing. Yeah. yeah. Maybe she was... Bang him like she wanted, and she was like, oh, this ain't up to much. I'm just going to shop him instead. Yeah. yeah. There's a moment when he's sort of doing his sort of walking along the streets at night, a la Midnight Cowboy sequence. Oh, yeah. And they see a film, uh, they see, see a, a porn film poster for a movie called Bedroom, Bedroom Mazurka. Bedroom Mazurka. Yep. Real film. Real and film. was influential in this. Yeah. 1970, that movie was released. I've written down that there's a waterbed running gag, but I'm not too sure exactly what that is. Waterbed. Oh, no. Noticing the fact that basically almost every bed you see is a waterbed, with the exception of the one at the start, including the one that's set up in the sex room. The sex therapy section is actually a waterbed as well. So, But, but he's a waterbed salesperson. Yeah, so but that by that tracks. stage he's not. So, Well, yeah, I know, but yeah. you know, he's probably got a few lying around. So I think that's basically it. And I'm going to say just one thing that really bugged me right at the very start. When the two feet, when we're below the bed and the feet are standing there, the position they're in is side by side looking at the bed. They're not face-to-face uh, yeah, 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 yeah. kissing. It's really I don't weird. know why that bugged the hell out of me, but it's like... There's a few weird feet position in the, in the mm. start of the sex scenes that are just demonstrated through the feet. It's yeah. Like, mm. yeah. It looks a bit like, oh, so that's your bed, huh? Yeah, that's your, yeah it's, it's like they spend a period of time looking at the bed. Just admiring Just, the bed. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Right, so I think we're pretty much done. I think so. I'm happy to give it three top hats. Oh, you terrible person. You took my things. You can say three top hats. You can be no. in agreement. You don't have to only match saying stuff with me. No, 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 no. no. All right, you... Okay, you're going to give it three top hats? I'm going to give it three spurs for the three-legged man. I actually was thinking, yeah, I'm going to give it four spurs. In context... Four? I'm going to give it... That's in, big. In context, in the era that it was created... And admittedly, with a certain level of insight into what may have been intended, which I know is probably not completely correct, but, uh, yeah, I'm going to give it four spurs. And you know how I feel about scoring things, so I'm giving this a triangle out of a pineapple. <laughs> but is it on a pizza? Yeah. If you want it to mm. be, because I'm all about consent. <laughs> <laughs> not much pizza in this movie, but then they didn't really have pizza delivery in Australia yet, or True. much pizzas at all at that point. No. no. I remember when pizza delivery became a thing. Oh, God, me too. Yeah. And then when we got apps on our phone where you could get pizza delivered, I think it was a Will Anderson joke. Oh, my God, you can get pizza delivered by your phone? Yeah. Yeah, that <laughs> was huge. Yes. But did you warm to the movie at least? You did warm to it a bit. 
Oh, I absolutely did. And by the end, I was, I am still looking forward to seeing the next one. Yay. So I'm looking forward to talking to you all about it then. Sweet. And on that bombshell. Yeah. I've been Daria. I'm unfortunately November. And I'm still Callum. And we'll see you in a month for Alvin Wright again. Mm. <laughs> Thank you for listening to Callum, Daria and November on Podsploitation. You can find more episodes at anchor.fm forward slash podsploitation. Contact us via podsploitation at gmail.com or as podsploitation on Facebook or Twitter. If you want to support the show, donations can be made at paypal.me forward slash podsploitation. All clips are for review and commentary purposes and remain the copyrighted property of their holders. Theme from Alvin Purple by Brian Cadd. Podcast theme music creation time by Kilo Cuts. Find and purchase their work at www.musicbrouse.de. That's M-U-S-I-K-B-R-A-U-S-E dot D-E. No waterbeds were harmed in the making of the podcast. Podsploitation is a moment of mayhem production. Can't you bastards talk about anything but sex?